In combat sports, no fighter is more revered than the heavyweight. The combination of size and power has a legendary, almost mythic aura. And in both boxing and MMA, the heavyweight belt has been held by men universally considered the greatest of all time. This will be a total annihilation. Today, Ryan Bader is the heavyweight. Oh, big shot! And holds the coveted title of Bellator World Champion. But with his attention currently focused on the light heavyweight World Grand Prix, a battle for the interim title has been set. Tim Johnson, an American hero who has found his true inspiration and inner fire with the recent birth of his daughter, looks to add to his three-fight win streak and continue his rise in the division. Valentin Moldovsky, protege of the GOAT, at a perfect 5-0 in the Bellator cage, looks to carry the torch of his mentor, capture Bellator gold, and ultimately battle for the title against the last man to beat Vader, the heavyweight king. Who will join the elite? Who will become a part of history and be able to call themselves the heavyweight? Sun Arena sits halfway between New York City and Boston, but Bellator MMA arrives tonight just about all the way towards crowning a new heavyweight champion. They are from different parts of the world. They are at different stages of their career, but tonight the only thing that stands between them and realizing their championship dream is each other. The veteran from rural Minnesota, he knows the back roads aren't always the easiest but his very long and very winding path has hit a sudden and spectacular career resurgence and now at age 36 has him one win from a title. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian-born phenom may have grown up in the same cold winters, but his rise has been meteoric, unbeaten in five years, unchallenged in Bellator at age 29. He is now just one win from making his dream come true. Now with that, Away we go. It is great to see you again. I'm Sean Grady. There are magic phrases in sports, right? They give us some chills. Opening day, seventh and deciding game. But, man, it's hard to beat heavyweight champion of the world. It comes with a global cachet. Imagine being able to go anywhere on the globe and be recognized. If only there was somebody we knew that could say that. Wait a minute. There he is. No, 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 no. <laughs> Big Maybe job. a heavyweight, but not a heavyweight champion. <laughs> <laughs> Thrilled to be back with John McCarthy. Heavyweights have these career resurgences. It's not unusual at this level for a fighter at this age and at this stage. But this three-fight win streak, there is a method to it. There's no fluke about it for Tim Johnson. Well, there's a method to it, and it's called hard work. But what has changed is, as you were saying, those back roads of Minnesota to the neon lights of Las Vegas and training at Extreme Couture and the people that he's training with and what he's been learning because he's a completely different fighter. He's got head movement. He's using his hands to get to his wrestling. He has evolved as a fighter in the last two years more than he did all of his career before, and it is paying dividends. Well, there's only one negative thing we can say about Valentin Moldovsky, that he hasn't been able to overcome adversity. You know why? Because he hasn't had any adversity. <laughs> no, he's not had any adversity here in the Bellator cage because he has walked through everyone, and he has walked through them with technique, speed, and skill. That's what makes him dangerous. Look, he trains with some of the best fighters. This is the light heavyweight champion here in Bellator, Vadim Nemkov. That's his training partner. Fedor is his training partner. Tokov's his training partner. He is always training with studs, but so is Tim Johnson now, and that is what makes this matchup so intriguing. What is it going to be, the speed of Moldovsky or the size and pressure of Tim Johnson? That's the icing on the cake. That's the piece of the puzzle with Ryan Bader away from the office right now on assignment in the light heavyweight Grand Prix. But we have a lot of business to attend to. We've got title eliminators. We've got title contenders. We've got blue chip prospects. 
championship fight announcements, you name it, we've got it. And one of my favorite parts of the night is being able to say hello once again to my buddy, Jen Brown. Oh, well, thank you, my friend. It's nice to have you back with us tonight. Of course, joining me at the fight desk, as usual, it's the former two-time lightweight champ, Josh Thompson. Josh, it's just the two of us tonight, so let's get right into it, right? I'm a little disappointed I'm not Sean's buddy. Well, hey, you know, you gotta, what's going on here? you got to put in your time. you got to put in your time. Okay, the interim heavyweight belt is on the line tonight, right? We've got number one ranked uh, Tim Johnson. He's taking on number three, Valentin Moldovsky. Stylistically, on paper, Josh, both of these two guys, they match up very well, good on the ground. Round, great in the stand up. So, what's the difference maker tonight? Well, they match up perfectly because they're very similar, except one is a little bit bigger and the other one is a little bit faster. And that's really what it comes down to. Moldovsky is fast. He's a smaller heavyweight, but he's that new breed of heavyweight. And that new breed of heavyweight, like a Ryan Bader, is someone who has really good wrestling, someone who is fast on the feet, has good stand up, and knows how to put the combinations together and drag heavyweights into deep waters and put them on their back. So once you put heavyweights on their back, they have a hard time getting back up. Tim Johnson, though, on the other hand, is a beast. Yes. He is a mountain of a man, as I like to say. But he's a big guy, and he's also, he's got knockout power, and he, when he does get on top of you, he inflicts damage. From the beginning of the bell to the end of the bell, he is putting pressure on you and trying to land the big shots. I'm telling you right now, if he gets on top of Moldovsky and Moldovsky can't get him off of him, it's going to be a long night for Moldovsky. That's right. Well, both men, they did tell us that this is the most important important fights thus far of their career. Uh, we can expect them to put it all on the line tonight. Well, that is our main event. And here's a look at the rest of the Showtime fight card coming your way. Now, we've got five incredible fights lined up in our co-main. We've got title implications on the line. We've got Liz Carmouche taking on the undefeated Kana Watanabe. Plus, we've got two fighters looking to climb the ranks of the lightweight division when Miles Jury takes on Sydney Outlaw. We've got undefeated Keone Diggs looking to keep his perfect record intact when he takes on MMA veteran and Daniel Vaishwa. Josh, I know you're really looking forward to this one. Yeah, it's a huge step of a competition for him to fight Daniel Vaishwa. He wants to get into that top 10 category, and this is a chance to do it. Daniel Vaishwa trying to stay in that top five to get back to the title shot towards the end of his career. Well, we're going to talk about that one a little bit more. All right, well, uh, another um, fighter uh, to kick off the night hopes to play spoiler to her opponent's Bellator debut. And for more on that, let's go back down to Sean Grandy. All right, Jim. Well, chips don't get much bluer than Christian Edwards. An undefeated young fighter's road can often be paved with those careful fights early on. But in a year of change on the fly, a last-minute opponent change here adds intrigue and danger in this one as an enigmatic, high-ceiling young fighter now steps out of the big stage. And now, we welcome tonight's first fighter, Simon Hipnay-Beyond. The term renaissance man probably gets thrown around too much, especially around you, John, I would imagine. But it's hard to avoid it with Simone Beyond because not too many painters are 6'6 with six knockouts in eight pro fights. It's been kind of an underground movement to get him a profile fight on a big stage. He had the fight in Rising, but funny how things work out because all of a sudden, in this crazy world, suddenly he's got it. And look who's opening the show. I, I tell you what, this, is, this guy is intriguing because he's big. Six foot five, came into sports through basketball, then fell in love with MMA, fell in love with the stand up game. He's got a very good stand up game, he's got a big right hand. But on the ground, if he's in the top position, this guy is lethal. I have watched him knock out guys with punches, I've watched him knock out guys with elbows. You do not want to be underneath, beyond in that cage. A new name at 205, try to play spoiler tonight under the bright lights. And now, his opponent, Christian Payne Edwards. Comparisons in sports, nine times out of ten, are just 
lazy. They're the tip of the sword. Rarely they have the depth as they tell the story. Christian Edwards, a big time prospect at 205. A lot of you know he's trained with, been befriended by John Jones. So the comparison is both easy and daunting. But I'll say this, John, when you spend time with him, I don't know where it starts with John Jones and ends with Jackson Wink, but there is an underlying calm of confidence that comes through with this young fighter. We've already seen it in Bellator. There's a calm of confidence because look at the people that he trains with every day. He sees the very best. He knows what he does with those guys when he's training. That gives him confidence when he steps in the cage. Take a look at him here. In the positions that he get, gets the back, sinks in the rear naked choke. He's had submission victories. He's had knockouts. Christian Edwards is good everywhere. That's what makes him a dangerous fighter. He's got good wrestling, good stand-up, good submissions. What else do you want? Let's check out the tail of the tape and the opener. Tail of the tape for this light heavyweight matchup. You gotta look. Six foot five for both guys, 206 to 204.5, 78.5 to 80 inch reach. They're looking pretty identical, and you know what? This is gonna be a fun one. A night that ends with a new heavyweight champion begins, as always, with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome tonight live on Showtime. Bellator 261 from Mohegan Sun Arena begins now with light heavyweights scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Introducing first the blue corner at six foot five, weighing in 204.5 pounds, making his Bellator debut. He enters with seven professional victories, just one loss by way of Cameroon. He fights out of Genoa, Italy, presenting Simon. And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot five, weighing in 206 pounds even. The undefeated professional stands with four wins, no defeats. He fights out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, Christian Payne Edwards. And the referee in charge, Todd Anderson. to Christian Edwards the other day and I was curious about a late opponent change for a young fighter who's still developing and then the more I heard him talk about it if Jackson Wink signs off on it I'm like you know what <laughs> those guys know what they're doing that's because he believes in the people yeah. that he works with he believes in his coaches Greg Jackson Mike Winklejohn Joey Villasenor when they tell him yes this is a good opponent for you this is going to be a next step up but you can take him he believes as I said, I sort of entered into this resistant to the easy John Jones comparison. But the, the more you spend time with him, there's a, there's almost a clone element to the way he carries himself, just the way he talks. Forget the way he fights and the upside. Well, the one thing that you look at with John Jones, John's very intelligent. He's super intelligent when he's in the cage. And you can see that Christian Edwards is the same thing. He's an intelligent fighter. You can look at him right now. Four fights, but he's nice and calm, relaxed. That was a slip. He's going to go for the takedown. His foot slipped out. So right away, doesn't close guard, goes to the butterfly hooks. Let's see what he does from the position. Something you want to see in a younger fighter calm when things don't go exactly the way you thought they were going to go. Because they're not always going to go the way you want. That's part of fighting. There's going to be times when you're tested. There's times when things don't go your way. And it's all in your ability to work through those problems. That's what's going to, in the end, make you that champion. Your tries. Control your tries. If you lift that leg up, you can sweep him. at one point was lined up to fight no Manhoff. That fell through. Now he, like a lot of fighters, have been have not been active because of the pandemic. It's not uncommon. Fighters are off 16, 17 months here. You need to be very careful when you get elevated by your opponent. Now go to work, Christian. Now let's go to work. Make them care. What did you want to 
to see Beyond do more of in that two minutes where he had that event. I'm going to be honest. What I saw out of Simon is he's having problems with Christian on the ground because normally when he gets into a ground and pound situation, that's the second time. Two slips. He has slipped. When he gets into a ground and pound situation, he has leveled some huge damage on his opponents. He wasn't able to do any damage at all. His last win, the Ryzen fight, was his opponent tapping the punches, essentially. Set it up with some numbers, though. Set up with some numbers. <laughs> right, Chris, we got two. Yep, use your 10s and 11s. Use your 10s and 11s. Touch your fingers. A lot of you know the story of Christian Edwards when he was first approached by Jackson Wink and said, how long do you think you want to stay? And he's like, forever. <laughs> well, I'm Christian, in. Sign me up. Christian was the first recipient of what Jackson Wink came up with as far as a scholarship. scholarship. Yeah. Bring a fighter in. They're going to house you. They're going to feed you. They're going to do all this stuff. They're going to get you ready to fight. What more could you ask for as a young fighter? There you go. 11 in. That's something we're going to look back at that five, ten years from now as being far more than norm. Look for your own yeah, crowd. I believe so. Stay up for numbers. Stay up for numbers. Don't you get it. his face, his ability to land the shots. He could, he could go for the knee. Right now, he's flaming out of the hand. That's smart. Young is still hurt. That knee landed flush. He's wobbling. That's an interesting, that's an interesting decision. They are not happy about it in Christian Edwards' corner. Well, that's in all honesty, that's on Christian. Christian gave a low in the action. You have that advantage, maintain that advantage. These have been very effective for Christian. Good short yes. right elbow. Taking what Biong is giving him here late in the round. Good left elbow. Biong's been working hard and he is. He's starting to breathe heavy. Not a good sign for him. Desperate need in the next 60 seconds. He's got to walk to his corner. There we go. John, walk me through the decision making process of an official when the mouthpiece is out. The decision-making process of that was that mouthpiece came out. Todd Anderson, the referee, he saw that. He realized oh, it. Go. But what he's looking for is a lull in the action. Well, Christian actually was the guy that made that happen. He did the separation and backed off. That's your lull in the action. If you're the fighter, you've got to know that, oh, I want to maintain at least some semblance that I'm going after him so I'm not giving the referee the opportunity to stop this and give this guy a possible break. That was a beautiful knee right there. You can see the mouthpiece coming out. Solid yeah, he's, he's knee by Christian Edwards. Ball. Landed flush. Second nice down. right hand down Second the down. pipe. Hey, Doc. The big difference you're seeing in the striking. Christian's been throwing a lot of straight shots for the most part. He's thrown a hook, but that right hand has gone straight down the pipe, and it's landed quite often. Time! Doc wants to see you. Come over here. Stand still. Let's listen in. He's going to show us something. He's going to show us something. All right. I don't want to take it this much time. All right. I'm okay. You understand what the doctor said? Not as much damage, but we're done. Here we go. Easy for the doctor to say. Very I easy got, for the doctor to say. Hey, don't show me something against yeah. Christian Edwards. Christian Edwards is uh, not trying Ready? to hit you. Ready? Go guard Ready? LeBron while you're out there too. Whoa! 
Bianca's Beyond is already when he's wobbling here to start the round. He's tired. Yeah, he is. Right now, his his arms are heavy. He's got to bring him up to protect himself. And nothing is going to get any easier. Now, let's see if what you talked about, if Edwards keeps the striking distance that he wants here. Take a look at the knees and elbows there. Five landed out of five for Christian Edwards. Four out of four in the elbow department. Everything he's throwing, he's connected with. I was told there would be no math, but that seems pretty hot. Yeah, that's one of those high percentages. These are, these are hope shots by me. Yeah, the big, big difference is, look at how easy Christian is throwing. He's throwing hard, but he's not throwing with everything while Simon is starting to load up. Stop! Time! Okay. Good? Ready? This, this time it was Christian Edwards' mouthpiece. We get that wrist, we get that rainbow. See, as long as Christian keeps that high underhook, that wizard that Young is trying to utilize is not going to work. Now we have a switch of the position. Christian has been incredibly accurate in throwing the knees, either to the body or up to the head. There you go. Stay active. There you go. Dante Davis tomorrow. Trying to be coming. When you get that wrist control, World champion. Three weight classes. There you go, Christian wrist. Simon Beyond just trying to get to round three. Christian doing a good job with that wrist control. Look at the right hand. Controlling that left arm of Simon Beyond. It's making the Simon doesn't have a chance of really getting the takedown at that point. And again, this is part of the patience of a younger fighter here is, you know, the, the heart rate doesn't get elevated. He knows Beyond is in trouble. Again, peeled, peeled the right arm off. Wrist control on it, trying to circle out. Very nice. Simon Young at this point pretty flat-footed in his approach, which is not a good thing. That's going to make him more of a target. There you go. We're going to talk a lot tonight about winning and performing. Those two different things. Christian Edwards is doing both of those things right now. Young looking for the Hail Mary here. Nice Nice Young's done a good job go. of coming back in this round, trying to you know, settle himself down, but he keeps on throwing big winging shots. So just don't try to kill him with them, just try to touch him. The more you touch him, the more problems he'll have. That right hand landed. Simon Young knew where Christian Edmonds was at. He was six feet away. Start to look for the things. You never want to look at, but you're starting to look at the skill set of Edwards and the things that are going to come in handy for him as he moves up the ladder against tougher and tougher and more experienced competition. So he's really starting to get the idea of how to control range. Those feints that he's using, look at, look at how much Simon is biting on most of those feints. But if you're going to use those feints and he's going to bite on them, then set him up and use that against him in the next series. See how he's biting on those feints right there? Every one of them. Nice, Every one of them. Nice. Nice little rip with a dip. This has almost become sparring. For right now, for Christian Edwards, it's looking that way. He's feeling very comfortable. He's in control of everything that's going on in the fight right now. Overhand right, piling up the strikes. Double change, where the 
call for the inside leg trip. It's about the only thing he hasn't been able to do through 10 minutes. Another very impressive round for Christian Edwards. Later on tonight, we're going to crown a new heavyweight champion. Will it be this young man, Valentin Moldovsky? who has sliced his way through the Bellator heavyweight division. And there's that guy over his shoulder who looks awfully familiar. And if you missed it earlier today, it is official. Fedor Emelianenko will return to the Bellator cage in Moscow in October. And obviously, this leads to a lot more questions. But, John, that's the beauty of it, because everyone is going crazy today on social media. Who's he going to fight? Who's he going to fight? Well, as we like to say in the television business, stay tuned. Stay tuned, because we don't know. Seconds out. Seconds We've out. We've seen you and Get I saw Fedor up. in Tokyo. We've seen him fight in the States. We've seen him fight all around the world. But that will be an extraordinary thing. Back up. Ready. Ready. Fight. What do you want to see here in round three from Christian Edwards? Come on. Christian Edwards, I want to see him do exactly the same thing, but once you get him biting on those feints, I want you to start throwing combinations. That, again, that, that number three, that number four, that's what he's not going to see, and that's what's going to put him down. The only thing he has landed, we can like kick, he landed that a few seconds ago. Numerous times Christian Edwards has thrown that exact combination, slipped off to the right, and he can throw that right hand again because he's got his opponent off, off center line, off balance, and he just needs to go right back to it. 22 years old, by the way. 22. Yeah, that's when you just look at him and you go, you're a super nice guy, and I hate you. <laughs> Three weeks from tonight, Juliana Velasquez, first defense in the flyweight title against Ms. Dynamite, Denise Keelholtz. Later on tonight, Anna Watanabe and Liz Carmouche in a fight everyone is assuming is a title eliminator. It may very well be a title eliminator, but like most things in MMA, not so fast. There's always other possibilities. There's always other possibilities, and it really depends on your performance. No which is what it should depend on. Which is what we're talking about with Christian Edwards. We're going to be talking about it with Liz Carmosh. We're going to be talking about it with Miles Jury later on. Again, same thing, but he needs to come back with that right hand again. Christian has set him up so many times. That is there. The opening is there. <laughs> Beyond stopped with that left hand because Christian Edwards was so out of range that even by the time he threw the putt, there was no point. He's having a real hard time. That beautiful right hand again landed by Christian Edwards. He's just having a hard time finding that distance to be able to set down his feet and actually touch Christian. He's throwing, but he's just out of range. We, we agree. <laughs> And full marks for Simon Beyond here for him. If you said after he took that knee two minutes into the fight that he'd still be in this thing midway through the third, it did not look promising. No, it did not, but it just shows a lot about you know, his heart, what he brings into the case. Yet there is no quit in him. That's what makes you respect the fight. If you strike from right there, Christian, he'll give you the back. He's got to unhook. Chris, control the ball. There we go. All right, let's look for a mantis. If we can get a mantis, we can push hard on that break. Mantis to bows. What he's talking about is he's, you That's see that pressure, one. all that pressure that you see him pushing, all he's got to do is then push forward and bring him back. Don't bring, that bring him down to the ground. It's almost as if he's used each round to work on something else. 
Yeah, it's almost like you know, there's been certain aspects of his game that he wanted to work on during the fight. So this is my round for this. This is my round for my grappling. I get it. Everyone wants the finishes. But this has been a dominant performance. And one of the things that Christian Edwards needs to go back to Jackson Wink and work with John. John Bones Jones does a beautiful job with the taking the controlling body and doing a foot sweep and bringing his opponent down. That would be a great technique for Christian Edwards right now. Two of them are probably sitting on the couch at some point in the future watching this right now. There's a lot of good things to look at if you're Christian Edwards. You know, what you're doing here in your stand up, your head movement, the way that you're controlling the distance with your footwork, all of it is good. The knees that you've landed. But every time that you're getting into these positions, you're burning a lot of energy trying to bring Beyond to the ground. You haven't really been successful with it. Young has maybe landed five shots in, the, in this 15 minutes, maybe. Indeed, it started all the trouble about two minutes in. Remember, Christian Edwards slipped a couple of times. The first couple of minutes didn't go the way he wanted them to go because he slipped. The other part that would work for Christian Edwards is a lot of shots to the head. He can always bring those to the body. That body has been open. 22 years old and job, taking steps by leaps and bounds is Christian Edwards. Bellator MMA proud to share the screen with Showtime's critically acclaimed premium entertainment. Let's see what's coming up on Showtime. It is time to do something differently. This is another eco trip for you. What? What? You finished? We are locked down. We need to be calm and quiet. You did not say that confidently. Let's get it! We are the Church of Comedy, boy! Congratulations, gentlemen. Y'all blew up. Ah. If I was young enough to get drafted, and they give you that little questionnaire to fill out, and when it got to that little section that said occupation, I would just write murderer. <laughs> Hoover had written, watch this Negro comedian Dick Gregory. Only a fool today would sit back and blame Hitler's army and not blame Hitler. The head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation signed a letter asking for the FBI to do an investigation of Dick Gregory. I want you on my side and I want you to help me take him down once and for all. Would I do absolutely anything to survive? Yes. Be greedy. Be hungry. He's not capable of alliance. Only destruction. I am a monster. All systems have to die eventually. Premium entertainment here at Mohegan Sun tonight and just delivered by Christian Edwards, the undefeated 22-year-old. We think is about to go to 5-0. and Michael C. Williams will tell us. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. All three, Eric Colon, Derek Cleary, Michael Murtha, all have it exactly the same at 30 to 27 for the winner by unanimous decision. Still undefeated Christian Payne. We saw a lot of clubs in the back of Christian Edwards yes, yes, yes. in that performance. Five, it was five, impressive. Five, 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 the 22-year-old who goes to 5-0. and oh. to see you again. the show. Thank you. I feel I feel you a friend. So at the end of all, I was always my with, 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 with you. Yeah. We are all Simon Beyond right now. We all want to see this young man, Christian Edwards, again. He's with John McCarthy. Christian Edwards, that was just a outstanding performance. Your stand-up looked sharp. You were throwing all kinds of combinations. You were throwing a lot of feints. You hurt him in the first round with a knee. Did you think you're going to get him out of there? Don't worry about it now. <laughs> um, yeah. He was just really tough, man. I, I obviously y'all can't hear me, but I just wanted to apologize. I really, you know, it it was a good fight. I did well, but I really wanted to finish. I wanted to make a statement. 
like my teammate Davion Franklin did his last fight looked excellent so I apologize to the fans but I appreciate y'all coming out and uh, thank you for watching me and supporting me I love you all truly seriously I'm going to tell you right now, you have nothing to apologize for. That was an outstanding performance. You dominated the fight everywhere. Here's my one question. Many times you were taking him to the cage looking for the takedown. Why when you were doing so well in the stand-up? Uh, honestly, you know, Simon, give it up for Simon, y'all. He's the toughest guy I've ever fought, without a doubt. You know, he really brought his A-game tonight. I was trying to get those takedowns on the cage, but he was strong. He was just really strong in the clinch, a lot stronger than I expected him to be. So I just wanted to, you know, show off my striking a little bit because I knew that, you know, I tried to time one of his leg kicks and take him down the first. He literally just threw me over and ended up on top of me. So, you know, I, I knew that the ground game wasn't my best option, you know. So I, I wanted to show off a little bit of my striking, what I've been learning in the gym. Well, it showed that was an outstanding performance. Congratulations on going 5-0. and oh. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Christian Payne Edwards. Hey, also, um, I just want to say that my, uh, my great-grandmother, she passed away on Wednesday, Wednesday morning, and I just want to dedicate this fight to her. I love you, and you'll always be remembered for as, for as long as my family is still one. We'll always remember you, Granny. I love you. That's an impressive young man on so many different levels. Christian Edwards remains undefeated with that performance. And in addition to everything else, let's not forget that was a short notice fight that he took. Jen and Josh, we're going to talk a lot tonight about wins and performances. And from where John and I sat, that looked like he got both from Christian Edwards. Well, it was such an impressive performance. And then here, just hearing that he's dealt with uh, some adversity, losing his grandmother this week, short notice fight, really impressive for him to come in. So, Josh, let me ask you, because he is still so very in the early stages of his career, a lot say that he is the potential to be the future of the light heavyweight division. What do you think? I think he has the potential. There was no doubt we saw that tonight. But you can still see the, the immature, the immature, just the lack of experience is what I should say. In that first round, he had him hurt. He had Beyond really hurt, and he didn't put him away. And the problem is, is you get into the rest of the fight, that gives that opponent opportunity to get you. And so he, that was the inexperience that came through. He rocked him, hurt him, then went to the wrestling. He should have made space, like John was saying, and let go some big punches, could have got him out of there. Would have been done earlier. Well, he's only a 20 two years old still an impressive performance moving to five and oh in the cage completely undefeated which is great come on guys all right well we've got a hot bellator summer coming your way and it is really just getting started here we've got we are back here in three weeks for a flyweight clash now the newly crowned champion juliana velasquez defends her belt for the first time against miss dynamite denise keelholtz that's friday july 16th then at the end of the month, the highly anticipated final of the Featherweight World Grand Prix where Bellator's pound for pound best and double champion Patricio Pipple defends his title against the dangerous and undefeated AJ McKee at Saturday, July 31st. Only showtime. And then adding to our summer lineup, we are officially announcing that Friday, August 13th, middleweight champion Gegard Mousasi defends his belt for the first time since defeating Douglas Lima. Now the contender, oh, that is John Salter, who is on a hot streak. He's winning 10 of his last 11 fights. That is Friday, August 13th, only on Showtime. All right, still to come. Tim Johnson, who had a dramatic and impressive year in 2020, has earned his right to the top of the heavyweight rankings and a chance at the interim heavyweight title. Now his challenger, Valentin Moldovsky, who trains with Team Fedor, is on a five-fight win streak all in the Bellator cage. We will get that matchup tonight in our main event. Well, it's now time for our featherweight feature bout, and it is a fight that Josh says could be the fight of the night, Sean. We're in for a good one. I don't think there's any question. Can we get a bigger locker for the goat? That was like a, <laughs> he was in a cubby. Don't sleep on John Salter. That's all I'm going to say. We'll continue that conversation a little bit later on. The disparity in experience is going to be on display in that main event, but nowhere more tonight than here. A story as old as the fight game itself. There's only room for so many in title contention at 145. Daniel Vaisho has been at that party from the day he walked into Bellator tonight, though a new face is gunning for his spot. Set now to make his way to the cage, Kiyomi Diggs. When a fighter comes from, say, Indiana, you don't hear them talking about representing or fighting for Indiana, Tennessee, 
Their own, their city, their neighborhood, rarely their state. Ask Keone Diggs about what it means to be Hawaiian, to be a Hawaiian fighter. He gets goosebumps. John, it took him a long time to get here, but from the sec he got to Bellator, it's been worth the wait. He has been outstanding since joining Bellator. You know, he's just, he's a guy that's brought into the sport kind of late, but man, has he gotten good. Here he is choking out. Scotty out. Out goes out. Beautiful rear naked choke, and then he doubles the effort with Derek Campos, a guy that we know is a gamer, has fought the who's who, and he puts Derek Campos to sleep with the same choke. He is no, out. That's it, that's it. Fun fact, Peter Cetera's Glory of Love was originally written for Rocky IV. This was gonna be the closing credit song to Rocky IV. Maybe that's why Keone Diggs picked it. It could be, it's got that little Hawaiian beat to it, but the big thing about Keone, he has got power in both hands and he's outstanding on the ground. Now making his way, Daniel Dredd Faisal. The older we get, the more we realize you don't get to control too much. And as Daniel Vaisho gets questions this week about his age, about his 20th year as a pro, he knows that full well. Take, for example, his nickname. You gotta love the fact, first of all, a doppelganger is actually a German word. I mean, literally, double walker or adopted worldwide as look alike. So, when Canadian rapper Aubrey Drake Graham, Graham soared to superstar, it was just a matter of time before the nickname Drake was put on Daniel Vaisho, but music and MMA have this in common. It's awfully hard to stay on top. So after seven years at the top of this division, here's the question, John. Is Daniel Vaisho still a contender, or is he now an opponent? That's going to be the question that I'm looking at right now, because if there's one thing I know about Daniel Vaisho, he is a technician. He is very skilled, and he shows that the heart that he has in all of his fights. His last fight, he could have given up. He did not. I expect the same thing from him tonight. Check out the tail of the tape. As simple as it gets, look at that 52 professional fights by Daniel Vigil, 40 wins. That is incredibly impressive against 9-0 with Keone Diggs. Bellator MMA moves now to the featherweight division set for three five-minute rounds live on Showtime. We introduce the blue corner at 5'9", weighing in 146 pounds, making the move down from lightweight. He brings an undefeated professional record of 9-0, fighting out of Waipau, Hawaii, presenting Kihoni Diggs. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5'10", weighing in 145 and one half pounds. The two-time world title challenger enters with a veteran professional record of 40 victories, 12 defeats, fighting out of Frankfurt, Germany, Daniel Dredd Meischel. The referee in charge, Kevin McDonald. No, we're good. Back up. Back up him? Yeah, thanks. Ready to fight? Ready to fight? Let's go. All right, let's talk about the weight cut for Keone Diggs. Normally fighting at 155. He struggled. He needed an extra 40, 45 minutes to make weight yesterday. And those who were around him said he didn't look the way he normally does the day before a fight. Well, this is his first fight at 145. You know, he's fought 155 his entire career. And it was, he stepped on the scale the first time. He was 146.25. So they gave him an extra hour to lose that quarter pound. He did. But when you're having to lose just a quarter pound when you've lost a lot of weight, that is not an easy thing to do. And he could absolutely change his performance as this fight goes into the later rounds. And it's this fight, as most people have said, as Josh was talking about earlier, can Keone Diggs sort of impose his will? Keone got that's stung so hard to shot right there. He did. Think about the guys Daniel Weichel has been in there with, and he's been so hard to finish. Well, if you look at the people that Daniel Weichel has fought, we're talking you know, who's who. I mean, he's got big wins against some of the best fighters that have been in the world. Guys, you know, here in Bellator, Emmanuel Sanchez, he had a win against him. Pat Curran, Georgie Carhanian, Brian Pikeman Moore from Ireland, who I love. 
Right? He's, he's even fought guys like Paul Daly, who just went over his 2007, side. by the way. That was yeah. 2007. I asked him, does he think about his age and the fact this is his 20th year as a pro, or only when other people bring it up, as everybody did this week? And he's like, usually just when other people bring it up. He's in that, that tough spot because he's had the two title shots. Well, he has had the two title shots. Look, he almost won the first sure one he fought against Patricio Pitbull. You were there. You were in there for that. That's one of the legendary Bellator moments. Well, it was. You know, look at it. That fight got stopped in the first round because of the bell because Patricio was almost out of that fight. Daniel Weisho came out in the second round, got a little bit crazy as far as going after him too hard, made a mistake, and got caught. That can happen. Good leg kick by Diggs about 15 seconds ago to slow Daniel Weisho down. You know, in every other sport, here's the thing about Daniel Weisho, he's been so hard to get. In every other sport, we honor the defensive player of the year. But you don't do that in MMA. And Daniel Weichel has been, he's been that guy for a lot of his career. He has. Daniel took a big left hook by Fiona Diggs, and he felt that one. That right got through. Fiona started to feel that range a little bit. A real difference when you're looking at Keone coming from lightweight down into featherweight is will the speed factor be the difference for him? Will he bring speed down and be just as fast as Daniel Weichel, or will Weichel have a little bit of an advantage in the speed? Right now, it looks like there's no advantage. Diggs has spent so much time in Arizona, the MMA lab, Anderson Henderson, among others. Keone really trying to time the right hand of Daniel Weichel landing a straight left on the counter strike. That's a nice, clean shot, right hand by Daniel Weichel. And again, did get through. He's been pretty comfortable with the range here the last two, two, two and a half minutes. Yeah. Started off the fight, he was a little uncomfortable with it. He wasn't able to feel exactly where he should be. Now he's got that range down. He's feeling a lot more comfortable in this fight. Sort of a half-hearted attempt. Weichel, he knew he didn't have it's going to keep coming forward. He came close, but it did not land flush. Big left hand. Drives Weichel back here late in the round. Strong start for Daniel Weichel, but this turn about midway through the round. It did. We think this one could be the fight of the night. We're all looking forward to tomorrow. Knockout specialist. Devonta Tank Davis looks to become a three-division world champion in his second Showtime pay-per-view. Faces the undefeated super lightweight world champion, El Azteca Mario Barrios, tomorrow at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific Live on Showtime pay-per-view from Atlanta. Keep your angle. You good, Daniel. Keep the focus. You good, okay? Reset shot. Daniel, reset shot. You heard me, Chuck? Okay, that's it. Keep the focus. Yeah. You've been in the cage with fighters of every age and every experience level. When a fighter starts to get old, starts to move towards the end of his career, what what do you see? What's the first thing you notice that this this wasn't the fighter that he was two years ago? Honestly, Sean, the thing that you see is he starts getting hit with shots that used to slide by, and all of a sudden they're not sliding by, they're actually landing, and they're landing flush, and they're making a huge difference in his ability to stay in a fight. I just see round one. That was, you know, round one was one. close, but if you remember back to the start of that Early round, out. Daniel Weichel hurt Keone. 
Right, just like, just like Keone kind of just stunned Daniel Weichel there. So I gave the round to Weichel. It was a close round. I could see where a judge looked and wanted to give it to Keone, but there's a cut on Keone right at this moment. And his right hand just cut him open. That's a better look at a nasty, nasty cut. At first look, does that seem high enough that it's not fight stopping danger? Yeah, the big thing to look at is that that was a right hand that landed, but where the cut's at, it's not a great spot. But notice that the blood's running down, it's not running into his eye, and you see nothing as far as the reaction towards it by Keone Diggs. It's not bothering at all. Take a look at those punch stats right now. 20 of 63 for Diggs, 17 of 33 for Vaisha. A lot of higher percentage in landing for Daniel Vaisha, just not throwing his punch. Vaisha was very wary of that left hook. Have you seen fighters who get the other fighter cut, who cut the other fighter sort of become focused on it? Many they, times. You can sort of change what you have been doing because it becomes a target. It can, and many times it actually affects you in a negative way, even though you're not the one that's cutting because you start aiming so much at it that you forget to go to all the different places that have made you successful at that moment in the fight. Okay, thank you. Biggest fight in Bellator history. Five weeks away with Patricio Pitbull and AJ McKee in the finals of the Featherweight World Grand Prix and the championship. The featherweight division goes on. What will happen when it's over? The only Diggs is an inexperienced fighter relative to the fight, but he's not a younger fighter. So he knows his time is now, and you've seen that in the two Bellator fights. Please, if you're, if you're watching the fight right now, look at the shots that are actually landing. A lot of Daniel Weissel shots, you'll see that Keone is actually blocking with his hands, his elbows, his shoulders. Not a lot of them are getting through. It's changed up quite a bit. as far as his aggression and how many shots he's throwing. He's trying to be a little bit more technical, not make a mistake, because he's been getting tagged by that left hand of Keone Diggs. Body shot against Emmanuel Sanchez. He, it was stunning, not just that he came back from it, but that you don't see Daniel Weichel, with the exception of that pit bull one we're talking about. He rarely gets hit like that. Yeah, you know, and, it's, it's moments like that when you'll look at a fighter, especially a fighter who's had a lot of fights, and look, he, he could have packed it in. He could have said, oh, that, you know, that hurt me, because it's, it's devastating to get hit to the body that way. And to have a guy on top of you throwing more shots to put you away, and instead of, you know, packing it in, he did everything that he knew how to do, got himself back in the fight, and went the five rounds. It says everything that you need to know about how tough Daniel Weichel is. He hasn't been knocked out since that famous pit bull fight he talked about. He hasn't been submitted in nine years. That's a clean right hand by Weichel. A better start to round two for Keone Diggs. And this time it's Weichel who finishes better. This is about as close to two rounds as we thought it was going to be.
Oh. Hey, we're doing good, bro. That's a modern. It's no? a nasty oh, one. Here's how it happened. Watch this right hand. Think Control right the there on Control that the brow. Good job. Just Starting presses the skin, perfectly. which now makes it split. Everything that he can do, right? It's a clean everything. shot by He's Daniel Weichel. Right now he's getting desperate, bro. He's starting to throw some feints, some big stuff. He's waiting for you to go first so he can come after, right? So let's hit that one three. As an official, forget a doctor for a second. As an official, what are you three, looking right? at when you see a cut that looks like, look like this? Body. Right, what you're looking right for, first off, the, the most important goal. thing about That's this cut, you're looking at, you're looking for cuts that go with the lines of the face. Meaning that they're going, you know, if you, wrink, you got a sharp hey, looking face like me with all the wrinkles and it's going along with those wrinkles. That's a good thing because it's going just in one line of the muscular structures. It's when they're going up and down across that they really start to become a problem. And that's why you see Keone Diggs is coming back out for this third round. We all love Sharp. Everybody. <laughs> Are we even through two? I have it. Even, I have it even through two. I think that you know this is a very close fight. The judges could have gone either way on it. each round. I thought that Keone actually hurt Michael. You know the punch with the cut. It was a clean punch. I don't give any credit to it actually cutting him. Uh, go, go off the credit of the punch, but I thought Keone landed the better shots throughout the round. You look at those strike stats right there, 28 of 113. That's a lot of punches thrown by Keone. 24 landing for Weichel. He said that the smoke is clearing for Patricio Pitbull and AJ McKee. We're all going to be on pins and needles watching that play out. The question is what happens next? Emmanuel Weichel said he's been on that list. He's been in that room a long time with Emmanuel Sanchez. And of course, and how long before we're talking about Aaron Pico being in this conversation? Well, when a striker like that praises the, praises the striker. Doing pretty good. Daniel Weichel is trying to parry away that right hand of Keone to land his left. You'll see him, he'll paw out with his left hand, slapping the right hand of Keone Dix to try to then take and counter right over the top of it. That's a good shot. At the left that came late for Keone Diggs. Good inside leg kick by Daniel Weichel. That slowed Keone for a second. what you want to see from Keone. If you're in his corner, you want to see him respond to those counter strikes in combination. High stakes in the featherweight division, and we're going down to the wire as we thought we would with these two. The undefeated younger fighter at 9-0, the 52-fight veteran Daniel Weichel. In his 20th year in the sport. It's so funny, many times when I'm watching Keone Diggs, knowing who he works out, he has a lot of similarities to Benson Anderson and some of his techniques. You're going to see that a lot. Ben Henderson is so generous with his time. With so many fighters, it's, it's impossible for his style not to become, which is so unique, to not start imprinting on so many fighters. He's been good for so long. Just an incredible run. Ben Henderson came to Bellator, and he couldn't have chosen a tougher menu. Uh, he's like, give me all the top guys on the menu here. Let me fight the pit bulls. Let me fight Korshko. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, stunned by Shaw. You see that stumble? You got it's a matter of time with that left. As the fight has gone on, it's found more and more of a home. Nice straight right hand. If there's one punch that Weiss has been able to land over and over, it's that straight right down the middle. This one is very much up in the air as we head to the 15th minute. Just slice by right there.
Very impressed with Keone Jigs. We talked about that weight cut. We talked about would it affect him. Absolutely not. He has had a full tank of gas. He has been at high RPM level this entire fight. No problem. And the fight still now bleeding through the nose. Left again. Keone sometimes comes with that left straight. It's beautiful. Then sometimes he'll loop it. And he leaves himself open for Vice of the County. Which is where those rights have landed that you talked about. Down the stretch they come, and they are neck and neck. High stakes, high output for Daniel Vice and Keone Diggs down to the final bell. Love it. Great stuff. You know what you're gonna get when you hear that hometown and that home state, whether it's PJ Penn or Max Holloway or Lima Lay, and Keone Diggs so proud of his home where it's been so difficult as he's talked about. He wants to be a role model and you can and he, you know, socioeconomically in Hawaii now, it's such an expensive place. It can be very, very difficult for a large portion of the population that you can fight your way to success. This was a, a very impressive performance. And some of these shots, nice little check right, hook right there by Keone, followed up by another left right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good eye. Yes, sir. That right hand found its home many times. That was the best weapon for Daniel Weichel throughout the fight. It was the end of the round. I love the fact they both just started going after it, trying to get after each other. Love it when guys give it their all. They wanted to go 16 minutes. And in a fight we talked about being even, sometimes you don't need the numbers to know it. And it's funny how they ended up almost identical because that's the kind of fight it was. Even within rounds, five minute rounds could be so long if the fight changed several times. And, and both guys hurt. You know each other during the fight. There was a lot going on. Uh, you know, I thought it was a close fight. I gave it to Keone Diggs. We'll see what the judges did. Let's find out. Ladies and gentlemen, for your decision, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Brian Miner, scores the fight 29 to 28. He scores the fight for Vaisho. Your second judge, Dave Peabody, scores at 29-28. He sees it for Diggs. Your third and final judge at cage side, Marcel Varela, scores the fight 30 to 27. Seeing it for the winner by split decision, Daniel Drake Vaisho. Tough to see that as a 30-27 because the rounds were, but it was difficult because the rounds were so close. There, there's no way in the world that like, that could be 30-27. You look at, Faisal was seriously hurt in that third round. That round should have gone to Keone. That doesn't mean that the fight wouldn't have gone to Faisal, but that third round was definitely for Keone Diggs. I'm with you. Curious, Jen and Josh, what you thought. We thought it might be fight of the night. It may have been. It was a great fight, but the decision, not what we expected. Great fight, yeah, definitely. Uh, Josh, I know you heard that announced. It's how you made a face. So what did you think? Who it's did you like think? vinegar coming out of my mouth when I say I agree with John McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, Daniel Vichel picking up his 41st win there. Um, impressive to consider how many fights he has had inside the cage. All right, well, tomorrow night, Showtime presents a pay-per-view card with a lot on the line for the two-division champion, Gervonta Davis. Here's an inside look at this championship battle. Bring on a challenge, like... It's good, but it's like, I know I'm better. At the end of the day, I got to show people who El Azteca is. I'm gonna do whatever it takes possible. I'm just as dangerous as, you know, as Tank is.
is testing me to see how good I am. Whole world watching this. If I say I'm that good, or anywhere near great, then I gotta prove it. And when I get out here and I get in that mode, it gets scary. Put that spike in your head, young. Chase that dream, youngin. Boxing is a hurt sport. I don't care how good your defense is, at some point, you're going to get tested. Your, your pain tolerance will be Is tested. this the test? 140, bigger fighter, undefeated, has the belt. Are they willing to withstand that punishment? When the bell rings on June 26th, yes, there will be a spectacle. You gotta go to hell to be a goddamn great. But underneath the lights, there are two men ready to march beyond the world they know. Soldier, keep on marching on. The march is on. Tomorrow's Showtime pay-per-view pits superstar Javante Davis versus undefeated super lightweight champ Mario Barrios. It all starts at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on Showtime pay-per-view. Well, Saturday, July 3rd, expect early fireworks when undefeated Chris Colbert defends his super featherweight interim title against Tuke Stoop, Niam Bayar, at Showtime Championship Boxing Saturday, July 3rd. All right, July 17th, Saturday, Jermel Charlo aims to add the WBO title to his laundry list of super welterweight titles. In his way, though, the WBO champ, Brian Castaño. That's lots to look forward to from Showtime Championship Boxing in the next few weeks. All right, well, tonight we've got two fighters that are looking to move up in the lightweight rankings. Sydney Outlaw, he has won 10 of his last 11 fights. Miles Jury is coming off of two decision wins, Josh. How do you feel like these two match up tonight? I think they match up very well. Styles make matchups, and this is the one where Sidney Owl is going to have to be aggressive, and Miles Jury is going to have to go out there and lay it on the line. He really needs a finish to get into that conversation of having a title shot. Miles Jury right now, sure, he's got two wins, but they haven't been they haven't been the best performances, and I've asked him about that. He's got all the tools. That was never the problem. When we talked to him this week, he said, I've got great stand-up, I've got great jiu-jitsu, he's like, I've got good wrestling, and I've got the looks. So he's very confident. He is certainly well. He's always been good at controlling the pace, but Outlaw he likes to bring that pressure. You know he's going to get after it. What does Jury need to do to make sure he fights his fight tonight? What do you mean? He, look, he can set the tempo however he wants, and he can do it anywhere. That's how well rounded it is. He can do it on the ground. He can do it on the feet, and he can stuff wrestling. And he can get wrestling takedowns. He can do it all. It's just a matter of him going out there and letting it go. And I'm sorry, but you can't get into that title conversation. I'm going to keep saying this over and over. You will not be talked about for a title shot until you start producing finishes. I don't care where you fight. This organization will not talk to you for about title shots until you start getting finishes. Well said. Well, Sydney Outlaw, um, he told us this week that he's been working on his striking. He tonight wants to showcase some new things in his stand-up game. Does he, is that the right game plan to keep this fight on the feet for him? Look, I support everything Sidney Allah does. His scrappling, his wrestling, all the things he does. He's working on his boxing. He is so talented. His fight with Adam Piccolotti, probably one of the best fights when it comes to exchanges. Adam Piccolotti is a beast on the ground. And the two of them were going back and forth at each other like Ferris. It was amazing to watch. I'm sitting there calling this fight going, man, this is absolutely nuts what is going on. But look, if he wants to mix up the boxing, as long as he doesn't get stuck or suckered in to that stand-up exchange, I'm okay with it because that will help set up his takedowns a lot more, which I think is going to be beneficial for him if he throws big shots, heavy shots, and closes the distance to get the takedown. Well, you know, one of my favorite things he said, he says that his goal tonight is to outperform his last performance against Adam Piccolotti. If he could do that, I think we're in for a treat tonight. I'm all for it. If you want to try and do that, <laughs> hey, I'm here just to watch. Well, both fighters hope that a dominant performance tonight will move them up in the rankings and put them in title contention. Talk about can they do that? Let's go back down to Sean Grandy to find out. John? All right, guys. Well, that's the question. They we're all obsessed with Pitbull and A.J. McKee, and we should be, but that's the featherweight Grand Prix, and there are questions to answer what happens next at 155, where Pitbull's still the champion. He's not going to fight his brother. Ben Henderson, Goichi Yamauchi coming off losses, which brings us here, because when an outlaw faces a jury, things usually get the side. comes in 
many forms, and in this sport, it exists by definition. It's the willingness to get into a cage in the first place, but for some, the cage is the easy part. Three years ago, Sidney Outlaw was in the middle of a nine-fight win streak, yet he was homeless. Two years ago, he fought Michael Chandler in Tokyo, a spotlight fight for a young fighter, yet he battled depression both before and after. He's an underdog tonight, John, there's no question, but with all the things he has been through before and during the pandemic, talking to him this week, this is a guy playing with house money right now. <laughs> I love Sydney Outlaw, and, and you, you gotta look at, he came in to Bellator, he was on a big win streak, and he actually got the chance to fight for Bellator. It was serendipitous for him because he would take a fight last minute. He went to Israel, and he performed great, got a win. He's just been a guy that comes trying to finish fights, just like what Josh is talking about. You want to have guys that are finishing fights, and that's what Sidney Outlaw tries to do. And now, making his way, Miles Fury Jury. Well, if you're free September 30th, that's Miles Jury Day in his hometown of Hazel Park, Michigan. An honor not a lot of fighters have received. And again, not too many were the first to knock out Takanori Gomi in Japan or have their own YouTube channel, which has been a pretty good springboard lately, career-wise, for people. But clearly, this is a guy who streams to the beat of his own iPod. But as fascinating as he is outside the cage, John, and Josh is just talking about it a little bit, he's becoming a bit of a mystery inside him. He is a mystery inside it because he is so good. I mean, Miles can fight everywhere. He's got great stand-up. He's got really good wrestling, and his jujitsu is top-notch. He can take anybody on in any of those realms. He just has to step on the gas. He doesn't do that enough. He needs to step on the gas. I think Sidney Outlaw is going to make him do that in this fight. Two of the top contenders at 155. Let's check out the tail of the tape. Look at that, five foot 11 to five foot nine, but take a look at the difference in reach, 72.5. Mr. Outlaw's got a 76 inch reach, that's a big advantage. To Michael C. Williams. Dick Mohegan Sun Arena live on Showtime Bellator. MMA now features three five minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing the blue corner first at five foot nine, weighing in 156 pounds even. His professional record: 15 wins, four defeats by way of Philadelphia. He fights out of Coconut Creek, Florida. Presenting Sydney Outlaw. And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eleven, weighing in the same 156 pounds even. As a professional, 19 victories, five losses, fighting out of San Diego, California, by way of Hazel Park, Michigan, Miles Fury Jury. In charge of the action, your referee, Kevin McDonald. Stay there again. Ready to fight? Let's go. High stakes at 155. John, we see so many 22, 23, 24 year old well rounded fighters now. When Miles Jury was that age, there weren't nearly as many. He stood out so much because he was so skilled so young. He was, and he was so good that you know, he was super cocky. That's what I see. But he, he deserved that confidence because he was that good. But this is what I saw in Sydney Outlaws. He's going to push the pace off, but he's not going to put a nice lift. Nice job by Sydney Outlaw picking him up, but again, should have brought him towards the center of the cage instead of against the fence. Yep, you're good. Nice leg wrap by Sydney Outlaw. You see those feet up off of the ground. That makes it very, uh, very difficult to move, to get anything. You see Jury turning his back. You know, Sydney Outlaw is a black belt jiu-jitsu from Henzo Gracie, so he's real deal when it comes to the ground. Go to the foot side, to your left. To your left, Miles. Get your back to your left. Why does he want him to go left? He wants him to go left because, again, look at that foot where it's at. That will help Miles get out of this position. Because right now, if you're looking at the way the city's got that, it's not on his ankle. It's actually on the bridge of his foot. 
Slide your hips out. Hit. See the outlaw keeps changing. Yeah. yeah. Figure four lock. Now going back. goes back to it. Yeah. Right those hooks. Go to your left, Miles. Left side. See now they're telling him go to his left side. He's he Sydney switches on the go to your left side. That's wrong. Sydney Allen doesn't have a ton of room near the fence. Throwing a lot of things at Miles Jury here. Yeah. Miles doing a good job of fighting hands and right now. He's got that Miles. arm on the chin. Look, there's a lot of pressure there that Keep doesn't the feel good, but Miles can relax, know that I'm going to be okay in this position, but he does not want to let go of that other hand so Sydney can start high. to put more pressure. Get him on the left. Left side. See him separate the hands. Left side, left side. To your left. There you go. Going, see that foot going down. That's why they're telling him to go to the left side. Unhook now he can try to unhook that leg and start to spin within that figure four. Yes. Keep working here, Miles. Yeah, I don't know if Sidney Outlaw is listening to his own coaches or he's listening to the plays coming in from in the other huddle. He's, he's hearing the calls on how to defend, and he's saying, okay, I'll just switch this before he does it. This is why football coaches hold the hip, plays hip, in front of their mouths so they won't see, read the lips on that camera. That's exactly it. Right now, you know, you're hands. seeing there's a lot of pressure on go. Miles as far as that. It's getting face cranked. Tell All of that chance. hurts. It's not fun to have it happen to you, but it's not going to normally stop someone with the skill level of a Miles Jury. But it's been three side, and a half Miles minutes of forcing Miles Jury to play defense. Yes, turn into him. Yes, well, there's down. zero head offense by Miles Jury. So now turn the question in. gets to the point of, well, how much damage is being done? Is there duration and dominance of the fight? Or is it more control? Well, we haven't seen anything close to a fight ending moment, but it's still been around in which not, not tough to figure out who's in the better of it for four minutes. And, that, and that's really the real problem if you're Sydney Outlaw. Right now, the judges Watch haven't seen you get close to an actual submission. They haven't the seen you side. do any real head damage on it. So, Miles. yes, you've had great position. You've been able to keep him from doing anything to you. All of that is good, but you're probably not going to get the 10-8 round. You're going to get a 10-9 based upon the fact that you weren't able to do any damage, and those submissions came from the position. Get your head to the other side. You were teaching a lot of us about the 10-8 round five, six years ago. Do you feel the understanding of that, that the evolution has come along in the last few years, that people are a lot more comfortable now with the 10-8 round, or is it still still a sore subject sometimes? You know, there's a sore subject because, you know, what will happen is the judges do a really good job with 10-8s, and then all of a sudden one will come in, and someone in an organization will sit there and be upset with it, then all of a sudden they want everybody to change. It's crazy. And the outlaw got up on the ground 15 seconds in and controlled the round. Roberto Duran, Marvin Hagler, Thomas Hearns, and Sugar Ray Leonard famously fought one another in a series of nine incredible fights. Showtime Sports documents the Seismic Collection in a four-part series, The Kings, available now on Showtime On Demand. You have to be fighting for something. Boxing for me was a way of making a statement. Racism was a big thing in our life. The four kings gave us the greatest period in the history of the sport. No matter where you've come from, your race, your creed, you can become champion of the world. We are in a golden era of sports documentaries. Of that, there is no question. I cannot even strongly recommend this enough. The Kings is amazing. It's an amazing story to begin with, but the way this story is told is absolutely going to be worth your time. It really depends on what age you are. How, you know, those four guys affected your life, but my gosh. Those guys affected my life. Those guys were everything. 
One of the greatest boxers of all time. All right, so you, you, uh, you went 10 8. I went 10 8 in the end when, when Sidney Outlaw started landing some punches and everything. Based upon the fact I had four minutes and 45 seconds of zero offense for Miles Jury. Freezer, fight those hands. Head down. Go low with them. Spread your legs. Up, up, up. Right away. Right away. Miles having a very hard time stopping the takedowns of Sidney Outlaw. Now Sidney's behind him again. Hey, turn into him. Turn into him. Now we talk about the takedowns. There was just one, <laughs> but that's all it needed. It was all it was four, needed. Four and a half minute takedown. Nice. What you saw with Sydney is he kicked the he actually kicked the foot out, pushed against the back of Sydney. Um, I'm sorry, Mile Jury's leg, which slid his foot out. That's how he got the takedown. If there is a criticism of Miles Jury during his Bellator run over the last couple of years, that he has been too comfortable. Is, is he too comfortable with what's going on in this fight? Well, I don't know if he's too comfortable with what's going on in the fight. What, what he's finding out is that Sidney Outlaw is a lot better on the ground than he was going to give credit to. And he realizes, man, this guy he can hold you in position. And it's not easy to get away from him. It's not easy to turn inside of his figure four. So he's going to have to work this out. Yeah, the only loss in the last three years for Sidney Outlaw was the short. Notice fight in Tokyo against Michael Chandler. Talking to Sidney Outlaw this week, there's com every fighter is confident, right? Uh, every fighter meeting is the same. I had the best camp of my life. I, I'm in great shape. Weight's no problem. I'm feeling good. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go for a finish. But there was something just sort of sincere about where he is in his life. That you just you felt the confidence coming off him. Well, the best part about Sidney Outlaw, and what you know, he said in his meeting was, you know, he talked about a lot of things. He talked about his girlfriend. And the, the meeting would still be going on if we didn't stop. Absolutely, you know, I love her, but sometimes I don't like her. And then, just the other day, he got married to her. So, you know, you gotta love the guy. He's funny, but man, I'll tell you what, he can fight. You can see on the ground, he is very controlling, and you have, a, you have the world against you when that guy's got your back. Sidney Outlaw's almost been more aggressive in this posture here in the second round than he was in the same spot in the first. Yeah, notice you thought was 10-8. He's landing a lot of shots to the ears of Miles Jury. He's coming around, hitting the face. He's not going so much towards submission. He's going towards you. Well, you're in this position. Let me strike. Let me hit you. Let me make you feel it. We talked about how difficult it was to finish Daniel Feischel, how difficult it has been. Miles Jury's yes. only been finished twice in 24 fights, so many of them at the highest level of sport. And everyone, you know, they'll sit there and guys are doing jujitsu at home. They're going, oh, you got to do is this. It is so <laughs> yeah. difficult to get a choke against someone that really knows how to defend against it, especially when you're wearing those gloves because they become a giant stopper on the inner hand. You can't slide your hand the same way. It's just much more difficult. Miles doing a good job of trying to relax. He's got pressure on that arm to keep, the, you know, some of the squeeze off. Same as round one, Miles. What are we going for? The glove on glove, trying to keep those hands. What you were seeing, Sidney, do you see how he's, he's trying to actually bury his hands onto the ground so he can use the ground as a point of pressure? See, Miles Jury's gone back to the both hands on the elbow. Yes! Keep it! Keep it! Just keep it, Miles! And now, in this position, Sidney could. He could switch to an arm bar. There's all kinds of things he could get, but it doesn't make sense for him unless it's right towards the end of the round because he doesn't want to end up in a bad position. Identical round two and a dominant one for Sidney Outlaw. Ten minutes spent in this entire position. Miles Jury has survived, but now he's going to have to do a lot more than that in round three. Three. Take the 
water. Take the water. Take the water. Big breath. Big breath. Hey. hey I get. I get the fan reaction, Hi right? I get it. High and lows. You go in there with Sydney Outlaw. <laughs> you want to boo Miles Jury and boo the nature of this fight. There's an awful lot going on in these positions, even to Miles Jury, his credit to not get finished from this spot for about eight or nine minutes has taken a lot. You see the energy that he has had to expend just to stay in the fight. Uh, it is not an easy position to be in, but we're, at this point, you're Miles Jury, you're in his corner, you're Jeremy Stevens, you're Eric Del Fiero, you're saying, hey, you got to go finish this guy. You're going to lose this. This fight, you are way behind in it. You cannot get it on the scorecards. You've got to finish it. If the first round was a 10 8, that had to be a 10 8. I think it was. What, was do, you, what do you know about the not match? Much. Oh, wait a minute. Literally broke. If you saw Sidney Outlaw winning the fight, did you see it going this way? Happening the, happening the way it's happening. You know, the, the big difference is, is you're not seeing from Miles Jury those attempts to get himself out of positions and take chances. And look at this. Look where he's going to end up. He took one shot. He swung for the fences early. And now Miles Jury is falling back into the same spot. You know, right now, Miles needs to make a decision. I've got to get out of this position, so I need to take chances in getting out. What's the chance? Well, right now, he's on that fence. Which so you cannot put your feet, he can't put your toes inside the... No, but he can have his feet up right. on the fence, and he can push off of it. But the problem is that left leg of Sydney Outlaws is kind of keeping him there. But if he can clear that leg, once he starts to lock up that body triangle, it's only on... He's in a position where the fence can help him, but with that body triangle, it's not going to change anything. Four minutes! Cubs pitched a combined no-hitter last night. This has been a no-hitter thrown by Sydney Outlaw. Literally. This is where, he, as Miles Jr., normally I would tell you, don't put your hand down to try to, you know, push the leg, unlock the thing. you got to start taking chances. Get to the side, Miles! To your yes! Turn you normally don't throw a 50 yards downfield with a triple coverage, but when you're down yes, three touchdowns to in the fourth, wheel. you better start doing it. Well, Sidney Outlaw's legs have got to be a little bit heavy. He's been in that body triangle position a lot, switching it back and forth. It, 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 it starts to exhaust your legs having that. Now, this is deep. This is deeper than it's been. Good look, a little deep when he was on there. Right the hand. Head to the opposite side. Notice he's still holding that hand, so it's a one-arm yep. choke. Not that a one-arm choke won't work, but usually that's not going to work against someone like Miles Jordan. This is a mountain to climb for Miles Jury right now. Yeah, right now, Miles is in a position. Yes. You can't win this fight. You've got to do something. You know, even if you end up getting to the point where you have to tap to a submission, at least go for it. Because you're not going to win this and to say, well, I didn't get submitted or anything. Great. It's still a loss. And an overwhelming loss. Turn into a Miles. Is just bleeding on Miles Jury. Unhook the bottom leg. Hip. Yes. Straighten it out. Use your right leg. Use your right leg. Yes. 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 Use it, Miles. Keep turning in. Yes. High, high, high. Next up. Hustle. This is as close as he's gotten to getting out. He's trying to get his shoulders Hustle. back to the yep. ground, but Sydney's going to come out on top. Hustle. Try to shake him off forward. And does for about a half second. <laughs> At least it was an attempt. I give him crap. He's trying. He's going for it. He's going to get another shot at it. And yet, 
like a bowl constrictor. He threw him hard on his shoulder there. That was a tough landing for Outlaw, but he still will not let go. He's like Velcro on his back. Could possibly get this choke. It's in a position where if he could squeeze, there's a possibility it could end up working. There it is, and he gets it. Full marks for Miles Jury. He took the chances late in the fight. This is what I was talking about. At least you're trying. It's better than to sit there and ride it out and say, oh, I didn't get submitted. You've got to make those attempts to try to do something in the fight. We talked about wins versus performances, and Sidney Outlaw just doubled down. He did. Let's take a look. You, right here is where it starts to get tight. You see the Sidney gets his hands together, palm to palm, starts putting a lot of pressure on the neck. And then at a certain point, he starts to switch it up, and you'll see him slide that hand right behind the head. See that hand starting to slide? It locks down inside. Now it's tight. Miles tries to fight it off. He knows he can't. There's your tap. When you spend time with Sidney Outlaw, when you know his story, when you know what he has been through, you really can't help but be happy for that young man. The biggest win of his MMA career. With a lot of uncertainty at 155, he is going to be in this conversation. Michael C. Williams will make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, the tap comes by way of a rear naked choke officially. Four minutes, 44 seconds, round number three. The winner by submission, Sydney Outlaw. Biggest win of the MMA career of Sydney Outlaw, climbing the ladder at 155, a title currently held by Patricio Pitbull. He's got some other business to attend to as we head back to gym. Well, thanks, Sean. In just over a month's time, the long-running featherweight World Grand Prix that started with 16 men will have a winner. Their prize? The belt, a world title, and a million dollars. Let's run back the road to the final. Welcome to Bellator MMA's featherweight World Grand Prix selection show. Here we go, AJ McKee. Flawless victory, December. Let's get it. Whoever won it, winner, winning chicken dinner. I'm ready to cook them up in a pot. Hey, Jay, you make sure you bring that skillet, boy, because I'm about to scramble your eggs. We had in mind to go with February. I'll be fighting Daniel Vaichel. He knows he didn't beat me. That's why. Where would you like? Fight in January. January. Hey, Patricio, come and get some. Who wants to fight me? I think everybody wants to fight him. You want to lose him. Pedro Cavallo. All right. The bracket is locked, loaded, and ready to launch. Here we go. That is deep right now. He's at it's over. It is all over. Darian Caldwell advances. Work for the ball. Out is the round goes on. It is all over! Just like that! AJ McKee! Wow! He's striking technique! And Pitbull pounces on Sanchez. Pitbull looking for that trademark guillotine. He is out! Number one, come on the wall. Patricio Pitbull, AJ McKee will battle to determine who will win the $1 million bonus check and who will be able to claim themselves the greatest featherweight. Oh, wow.
One million dollars is on the line and Saturday, July 31st, the final fight of Bellator's featherweight World Grand Prix. The champion Patricio Pitbull will defend his title against the undefeated AJ, the mercenary McKee, live Saturday, July 31st, only on Showtime. And I am just so excited for this matchup. Uh, look at AJ, he's here taking in the fights tonight. You know, Josh, it's been so enjoyable to watch him become this unstoppable force as he's been making his way throughout the division. Now, let me ask you, does he have what it takes to stop our pound for pound best in Patricio Pitbull? Of course he has what it takes, but a lot of people have had what it's taken to, to do it. They just haven't been able to do it. Sure. So there's a big difference. He has all the skill and all the ability, but he's never fought anybody or faced anyone like Patricio. So he's got his hands full, that's for sure. It's going to be a tough test, but I look forward to that one. It's going to be a great one. All right, well, uh, tonight, two women at the top of the flyweight division look to become the next contender and hope an impressive performance tonight can solidify that spot. Now, Liz Carmouche, she is a veteran to the sport. She sits uh, in the number three spot here in our rankings. Kana Watanabe, she sits right below her at number four. She's coming in undefeated. Uh, Josh, both women need to make a statement tonight. What can we expect? Yeah, Liz being number two and then Watanabe being number three, what they need to do is they both need to get finishes. I'm going to continue to say this throughout the night. If you are not getting finishes, do not expect to get the call for the title shot. And so what, with Liz, all she needs to do is go out there, implement her will. She jumps to uh, Deanna Bennett's back here, gets to the back, gets the choke, nicely done in her debut. But I want people to remember, in that fight, she won the first, lost the second, it was going into the third round. She had to get something done. So she did that, that was great. But then when she fought Porto, she just got through the fight. She was dominating in all positions. She had a great fight, but it just wasn't impressive for what, for what you want from Liz Carmouche. If I'm gonna say you're gonna fight for the title, I wanna see you finish in fights. And I think there's no doubt she can do this. It's just a matter of there needs to be a sense of urgency to dispatch her opponent. Well, she's got a tough opponent tonight in Kana Watanabe. She is undefeated. Uh, she's also got that Olympic-level judo background. What kind of problems does she present for Liz tonight? Well, she opposes a lot of problems for Liz because she is taller and longer. A lot of people are taller and longer than Liz, but she's taller and longer. That long and lanky type body feel that John was talking about earlier, it just fits for MMA. And she fought um, Alejandra Lara earlier, and when she fought her, she was able to get on top. When she was able to get on top by using her throws right to the transition to the mount, she was impossible for Alejandra Lara to get off. And so to get her off of her. So what happened was she struggled on the bottom, used up all of her energy, couldn't get couldn't get out from underneath her. Watanabe is tough on top. She's got big power in her right hands, and she's got the judo to get the fight to the ground with heavy hip pressure. If she does that, Liz is going to have a hard night. Well, uh, we've also got, you know, the flyweight title fights coming up July 16th with the champ. Juliana Velasquez taking on Denise Kielholtz. Lots on the line for both women tonight as that number one contender spot is up for grabs. All right, well, let's head back down to Sean Grandy to get this co-main event started. Sean? All right, Jen, that's the puzzle. Those are the moving pieces. The championship fight on July 16th. Velasquez took the title from Alimale McFarland, so the question now is what is next for the winner? The Eliminator, or is this a title eliminator? The Judo Beauty Beast, Kana Watanabe. Even halfway around the world, the name Liz Carbouche means something, especially when Liz herself grew up in Japan. Kana Watanabe knows the Liz Carmouche name. She knows the Liz Carmouche reputation. But this you're looking at is an undefeated fighter and a world-class judoka. She's fought on the big stage. She's won on the big stage. And if she is the least bit intimidated by her opponent or the circumstances tonight, John, she has done a masterful job of hiding. She is not worried about anything. This, this woman has been competing her entire life. And when you talk about competing in judo, you're talking about a very tough road. It's not an easy go. She was world class, and she brings that into the cage. And we've seen judokas in the past that have been very successful in an MMA cage based upon their ability to utilize that skill set, bringing their opponents to the ground. Whoever could you be talking? I have no idea. Maybe she fought Liz. And now her opponent, Gorilla Liz Carmouche. Because once upon a time, 
Liz walked to the cage to face an undefeated Olympic level judoka turned undefeated MMA fighter. And of course, that fight with Ronda Rousey in 2013 was talked about as a barrier breaker. But of course, Liz and Ronda, Chris Cyborg and Gina Carano, and Marlis Conan and Sarah Kaufman and Misha Tate, and Julia Button, Julia Kenzie, and Shayna Baszler had long since broken that barrier and strike force right here on Showtime. But Liz Carbo, she is a walking barrier breaker, an aviation engineer, a Marine, three tours of duty in the Middle East, and now in search of her third world title fight. John, she has a knack of making very good fighters look bad. Yes, she does. Our tail of the tape for this flyweight matchup. This is going to be a good one. Take a look at the record 15 and 7. Liz Carmouche has fought the who's who of MMA. 10 0 and 1 for Kanawat Navi, but this is absolutely her toughest opponent to date. Capital MMA now presents the co main event of the evening. Three five minute rounds in the flyweight division. And now live on Showtime, we introduce the blue corner. At five foot six, went in 125 and one quarter pounds. Her undefeated professional record: 10 wins, no losses, one draw. Fighting out of Tokyo, Japan, Judo Beauty Beast Kana Watanabe. And across the cage, her adversary, front side of the red corner, at five foot six, weighing in 125 and one half pounds. The two weight class former title challenger tonight brings 15 professional victories, seven defeats by way of Okinawa, Japan. She fights out of San Diego, California, Liz Guerrilla Carmouche. In charge, your referee, Kevin McDonald. has been saying it all night. There are wins and there are performances. Liz especially needs both. Boy, Liz she did. Coming out really strong, coming up forward. A lot of pressure. to Josh Thompson here because he said you need to have a finish she says really let me show you what a finish is that was just unbelievable by Liz Carmouche outstanding watch these shots a lot of pressure in the beginning the inside leg kick you see it squares cut off that left hand right hand starts it off she's buzzed right there you see her starting to go back she's not that right hand was the one that's the one that really started to seal the deal Liz kept on going after it, crushed her space a little bit, but she just started lighting her up. Good stoppage by Kevin McDonald. Great win for Liz Carmouche. Look at that shot with the right hand. That really started to buzz her. And she, she went backwards and backwards till there was no more backwards. There was only so far you can go. And when you're up against the fence and you cannot move your feet, you are in trouble. Liz Carmouche just went wild on her big right left hands. That right hand was the one that made the big difference in this fight. This was an undefeated fighter that Liz Carmouche just rolled through. Well, there's your answer. That's as dominant as dominant gets. Michael C. Williams makes it official. Ladies and gentlemen, it comes to an end. 35 seconds into round number one. The winner by knockout, Liz Guerrilla Carmouche. 
Well, the talk wasn't even whispers about Liz Carmouche. It was that she doesn't have big finishes. She doesn't have dominant performances. Well, she just answered with the world watching, and Liz Carmouche is with John McCarthy. Liz Carmouche, hello! That was, you came out from the very start. You were aggressive, you were going after her. What was going through your head? I think I told you guys, I said a finish time at 323. I, I guess I was a little overzealous. I wanted that finish, I want that belt. And I knew that tonight I had to put on a strong finish to show that that's what I meant, and I mean it. Did that, did that be, was that part of your mindset that I need to have a finish so I can get that title shot? It was also, I wanted her to make sure that when she th looks back to that loss on her record, she remembers me with a hard finish. Well, I'm going to remember you because that was just an outstanding performance. You went after, you hurt her with the left hand, then the right hand, but the right hand kept landing time and time again. When she went up against the fence, did you know, oh, I'm going to finish this? Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, that was an outstanding performance. I will tell you, that's the type of performance I think deserves a title shot. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner, Liz Carmouche. And Jen, that guy sitting next to you all night has been calling for it, and he got it. That's right. Well, you asked for it, Josh, and uh, she delivered tonight big time, huh? Thank you, Liz. <laughs> it was perfect. That's what you want. Scott Cobra sitting case side. You want to make an impression? He was texting me right after that. That's what she needed. We'll see if she gets the shot. I can't I can't imagine her being denied after that performance. Great job. Great job tonight. Uh, move into 3 0 inside the Bellator cage. I know she'll have all eyes on um, that by July 16th for sure. All right. Well, tonight is an unprecedented night in Bellator. It is our first ever interim title fight in what is arguably the most famed division in the sport, the heavyweight. To revisit the story of this infamous division's belt, let's hear from a man with a very unique perspective. I'm not just a heavyweight. I am the heavyweight. When I joined Bellator back in 2017, I immediately won the light heavyweight title. And now the new Bellator light heavyweight world champion. But it didn't take long before I had an itch that needed scratching. The heavyweight division was calling my name. The timing was perfect, and Bellator was set to announce their inaugural heavyweight world grand prix. It is being hailed as the toughest tournament in MMA history. First up for me, King Mo the Wall. 15 seconds is all it took for Ryan Bader to book his passage to the semifinals. Followed by Matt Mitrione in the semis. Ryan Bader as dominant a performance as we have seen. And then standing across the cage for me in the finals, the greatest of all time, and what might be my greatest moment in MMA. Fedor being the normal stoic guy is going to do a little bit of a half hitch. That's his fate. And watch for that. Oh! oh big shot! And it's all over! Ryan Bader knocks out Fedor Emelianenko! There I was, Bellator's first champ champ, sitting on top of not one, but two weight classes. Fast forward to August 21st, 2020. After losing the light heavyweight belt to Nemkov, timing is on my side yet again when Bellator announces the light heavyweight World Grand Prix. The winner will walk away with $1 million. After advancing to the semifinals with a dominant performance over Lyoto Machida, I now find myself one step closer to Vadim Nemkov and reclaiming what was once mine. As for the heavyweight belt, it still sits with me. But tonight, two of the division's best will battle for the interim title. Tim Johnson, winner of his last three fights, takes on 10 and one Valentin Moldovsky, a fight between the number one and the number three ranked guys in the division. What's on the line? Ultimately, it's a shot at me and the chance to become the heavyweight. Until then, I'll be right here waiting for the winner. Good luck, boys.
You gotta love that. Well, the, the king is absent tonight, but this interim heavyweight title bout provides two men with the right to fight Ryan Bader. Now, both Tim Johnson and Valentin Moldovsky, they told us, Josh, this is the biggest fight of their career. Now, you've been here before, uh, getting ready to make your walk to a title fight in a big stage. What's going through their minds right now as they're about to enter the biggest fight of their career? Well, if you think about the title, it gets away from you. You start letting your mind wander. For me, I didn't think about it. So when, when I was walking out there, it hadn't hit me yet. But when they strapped that belt around me, the reality had set in that they can never say you didn't do it. And so that was the one thing I didn't realize how important it was until after the fight, after I had won. One of them's gonna walk away the winner tonight and have that belt wrapped around their, their waist. And they're gonna realize at that moment how important it is. Well, let's talk about these guys. So Tim Johnson, he's looked great in these last three fights. Uh, he says he attributes that to uh, really settling in at Extreme Couture. He says he's got his confidence back. What do you want to see from him tonight? I want to see him impose his will. He's the bigger fighter. He's he's a, he's a true heavyweight. I believe he cuts weight to get to heavyweight. He's a big guy. But in saying that, he's got to learn how to implement his will. He's got to press him to the fence. He's got to let the big hand, the big shots go like he did against Tyrell Fortune. He set it up by lowering his level. And then with Matt Mitrione, he was able to get the takedown. When he got to the top position, he was relentless. And that's what he needs to be in this fight against Moldovsky. But can he get Moldovsky down? And how much pressure does he put on himself to get Moldovsky down? Because he does not want to be on the feet too long with Moldovsky while the speed is still there. Moldovsky is fast. He's a good wrestler. He does all the things that Tim Johnson does very well. So what Tim Johnson needs to do is make sure he presses him the fence, makes him carry his weight, and if he does get the takedown, just start unleashing heavy, heavy shots. When we talked to Moldovsky this week, he said, look, I know that Tim has power in both his hands. I know he's a great wrestler. He thinks that it's his speed, as you just talked about, that's going to be the difference maker in this fight. Do you agree? Yes, I do believe the speed is a factor because speed kills. And that's that, that saying's been around forever because it's true. And when saying's have been around forever is because they are true. And so the fact is, is if he fights a smart fight, quick hands, stays elusive, never stands directly in front of Tim Johnson, he will have a great chance of getting the win tonight. You can see from all the highlights here, he's just touching people, he's smothering people, he's moving around them, getting to their hips, getting the takedowns, hand shucking them. I mean, he's doing things to these heavyweights that these heavyweights are not used to because he is the smaller fighter, he is the quicker fighter, he's just as good of a wrestler. He does everything to the highest level, and his camp, they're not bad themselves. Oh, yeah, Tim F Team Fedor there, you see, warming up. Um, it's, uh, you know, he's got an impressive group around him, just like we talked about Tim Johnson does. So both had great camps coming in, they told us. Both come from good, great teams. Not good teams, sorry, I apologize. Great teams. Both of them are surrounded by other talents that are in their, in their camps, and they have elevated their level, for sure. Now getting into the top, you know, top positions to, to see who's going to fight for the title. One of them's going to walk away the interim champ. Okay, and the other one's gonna go home with dreams broken, but they've got to make their run back. Whoever's gonna fight Ryan Bader though, has their hands full. Uh, that's true, all right. Well, I cannot wait to see these two heavyweights collide tonight. First, we gotta get him into the cage. Sean, back down to you. Yeah, the moment has arrived. And here's the thing to remember when you're seeing that Ryan Bader video, when he became the heavyweight world champion, when he knocked down Fedor and ended a half decade run of that title being in limbo. And that is history that will not repeat as a new face and a new name is about to keep the division warm in his absence. Just physically is very fast, he's very strong, he's a dynamic fighter. Just like that! And another shot right on the button, but he's in big trouble. Moldovsky pouring it on, and it's over. Another win for Team Fedor, it belongs to Valentin Moldovsky.
would make the case that Fedor Emelianenko is the GOAT of heavyweight MMA. But if you did, Valentin Moldovsky has his law degree. In fact, he seemed to pursue everything but MMA. It was a chance meeting with Fedor in 2015 that convinced him to drop everything else and pursue it. And I'm going to suggest, John, that he has chosen wisely. I would say that he's chosen wisely because he is a dynamic heavyweight. He's that new breed that we're talking about. You know, he's the tweener, really. You know, there's been smaller heavyweights. Randy Couture was a smaller heavyweight. Fedor has been a smaller heavyweight. Then we had the monsters. But Moldovsky is fast, and that kills. Use your speed as an advantage. you got to use your feet, use your hands. That will keep you at distance. Keep this fight technical. Do not get into a brawl with Tim Johnson. Tim Johnson is a brawler. He will use his weight. That will wear you out. That would be a bad thing for Moldovsky to do. Good. A narrow split decision loss and rising on New Year's Eve in 2016 is the only blemish on the dominant record of Valentin Moldovsky. One win from the heavyweight title. you're saying because Tim Johnson turned that corner. He was a good fighter, but there was the guys, you know, that would give him problems because he was very static in his approach. He would use his wrestling, his stand-up was just more to get to the wrestler. Now he's using his stand-up to hurt guys. What he needs to do for his keys to victory, do not allow Moldovsky to have free movement. If you let him move around you in the cage, you're gonna have a hard time catching him. But once you get him up against the cage, make him carry your weight, and if possible, take the fight to the ground, be on top, and be heavy. He's a new dad. Tim Johnson's first Father's Day was last weekend. He was asked this week if being a new dad meant he had to change anything in camp. He said, yeah, diapers. <laughs> the tail to tape in the heavyweight championship fight. Real simple here, you take a look at the weights here. 260 pounds for Tim Johnson, 234. That's a big difference in weight. Can Tim Johnson use that as an advantage in this fight by putting the weight on Valentin Moldovsky? It is main event time. It is heavyweight world championship time. It is Michael C. Williams time. Bellator MMA live on Showtime from Mohegan Sun Arena. The time has come for tonight's main event. Five five-minute rounds for the interim heavyweight championship. Sanctioned by the Mohegan Tribe Department of Athletic Regulation, Chairman James Gessner, President of Sports and Entertainment, Mr. Tom Cantone, and supervising at Cave Side Director Mike Mazzulli. And now, first introducing the blue corner. At six foot one, weighing in 234 pounds as the number three ranked contender. He stands near perfect as a professional. Ten wins, just one loss. Representing Team Fedor, he fights Adam Stadionsko, Russia. Presenting Valentin Modovsky. And across the cage is adversary, fighting out of the red corner. At six foot three, weighing in 260 pounds even, ranked number one. He enters tonight with 15 professional victories, six defeats, fighting out of Las Vegas, Nevada. He hails from Lamberton, Minnesota. Introducing Tim Johnson. In charge of the action, your referee Todd Anderson. Yeah. 
gentlemen, we have the rules in the back. Protect yourself at all times. Obey my commands at all times. If you wish to touch gloves, do so now. Back to your corners. Todd Anderson has never refereed a Valentin Moldovsky fight. He's been in with Tim Johnson once, and that was that loss to Czech Congo. That's what it tonight is about. And 40 years from now, with a grandkid on their lap, the winner of this fight is not going to say, talk about the night he became interim Ready? heavyweight champ. Ready? Hey! Not at all. You are the champ. It seemed, John, Roy Nelson had the blueprint, but it was just impossible to execute. Well, he had the blueprint and, and an idea of how to beat Moldovsky, but just having just the blueprint means one thing, being able to execute that blueprint is another. And right now, that speed that Moldovsky has creates big problems for big men. Cage control might not be the sexiest topic in MMA, but it's going to be big over what could be the next 25 minutes and who has position along that fence. All the all the big heavyweights, they want Moldowski to eat a chili cheese hot dog and start gaining weight and slow down. You think about those names, even, you know, Daniel Cormier and Kevin Randall was a great name. That was a nice left hand thrown inside by Tim Johnson. He's got the idea of he wants to bring that hand sometimes from the uppercut position, sometimes straight down the pipe. Watch the head movement and the line with Tim Johnson, because this is what you were talking about, the difference in the two fights with Jack Conner. That's a good shot. He's, been, he's, he's really got much better at taking his head and bringing it off the center line where it used to always be where guys were able to know exactly where he's going to be, throw the shot, and let him run into it. He's now taking his head, moving it off the center line, creating different angles. That's what's making him successful. Now, Tim Johnson is a right-handed person, but he wrestled with his right foot forward, exactly. which is why he fights this way. A lot of guys, you know, Matt Hughes used to do the same thing, and it's a matter of you're so comfortable because you've done it for so long that you think, I can't get where I want to get with a takedown if I switch my feet and go to an orthodox stance. So let me just become a softball. See it in baseball, a lot of uh, people are right handed, back left handed. Just becomes a comfort thing. Nice exit by Moldowski. It's always important when you get in that clinch, you decide that you're going to be the one breaking off. Make them pay for being in that clinch with you. You saw Tim bring his head off that center line. That's why that shot missed. Talking to Valentin Moldowski this week about, I asked him specifically about Fedor, who if you missed the announcement earlier today, will fight in the Bellator cage in Moscow in October. And when you think about the elite of the elite, they don't, John, often make great coaches. So, uh, because you, how can you teach the things that only you can do? And yet, here, I mean, we got to call him a player coach at this point because he's still acting. But when I mean, you think of the elite of the elite, you become great coaches. And think about Nemkov now, and let's not forget Tokov. This is an extraordinary stable of young fighters that he is he's leading. Yeah, and they're all young fighters. That's the amazing part. And they, they listen to him. They believe in him. Nice job by Tim. See, this is the ball. It is a good thing for Tim Johnson. And again, look who's carrying the weight right here. That's it. That's the whole, that's what he wants to do. Use that weight. Roy Nelson tried to do it and could Right now, Moldovsky's arms are inside. Just that weight of Tim kind of bringing his head down, pushing a little bit down, making those arms fill up with blood. Your elbows, your wrist control. 
Bird wrist control because Maldowski's had a couple of good exit shots. Said the player coach, the goat of heavyweight MMA, who will return to the Bellator cage October 23rd in Moscow. That announcement coming earlier today. And I guess that's what social media was invented for. Who is he going to fight? <laughs> you know, it's Let amazing. the discussion most, begin. Most of the time, a promoter wants to put out, this right. is who they're fighting with. Scott Coker says, I, right now, I don't know, and so I've got a couple people in mind, and we're going to figure it out. And so now everyone is saying, well, who are those people? <laughs> well, said if, he, if Scott Coker goes to social media tonight, I'm sure we'll find a couple of hundred suggestions. <laughs> Watch our heads when we come together. Watch our heads when we come together, OK? Now, interesting, Todd Anderson pointing it out, because we see that Tim Johnson wants Ready? that head. Ready? Hey where he wants it. Yes. And so he's calling attention to the clash of the heads. Close first round, lean Moldovsky a little bit. Yeah, it was it was a close round, but if you're looking at who landed the better, cleaner shots overall, Moldovsky was the guy that got it, but Tim had his moments. That was a oh, two shots yeah. in a row Tim Johnson just took. Right here, the one thing you'd want to see Tim do as Moldovsky is moving to his left, instead of following him, step off, just like you just saw him try to do. Step off and cut off that cage and come into him and do something to make him pay for trying to just rule that movement. Tim Johnson was preparing for a 25-minute fight out in Las Vegas. He added a lot more cardio, a lot more road work, and that is in the early summer, late spring in Las Vegas. It's not easy to do. No, it's not, but you can tell that knee by Moldovsky, that hurt him. That definitely got his attention. You see that he's trying to guard against that happening again by bringing his leg up. And now they're both starting to get a little slippery, a little bit more sweat. It's going to be harder for Tim to hold on to Moldovsky. That was a good attempt at the counter left, I'm sorry, counter right hand by Tim, and that just a little bit off target. The idea is correct. Give me some heavyweights that were as hard to hit as Moldovsky because they were so quick and elusive. <laughs> you know, when you're looking at heavyweights, there's not a whole yeah, lot that are, that's, you're, you're going to say, well, they're a hard to hit guy yeah. because most of them don't have a lot of movement. They don't have that where they take and move their body all over the cage because it burns a lot of energy and to move all that weight is not easy. So you're not going to find a whole lot of them that are out there that were real successful. Good body shots by Tim Johnson there in that break. Tim got hit again by that left hook. It's generally not one and done either with Moldovsky. It's either right kick, left cross. Oh, 
Just tough puffs to figure out. And, and you see in just the movement that Moldovsky has to make Tim Johnson move. To make sure that's the best shot so far for Tim Johnson. That was a good shot by Tim. Again, immediately goes to that when he wants to be a dominant position, he use that weight advantage after he gets Moldovsky hurt for a second. Speaking of goats, he doesn't see 25 minutes. <laughs> hey, what does Chris Cyborg know about 25 minutes? <laughs> I mean, she did. Well, she definitely knows about 24 minutes and 45 yeah, seconds. True. That last fight, incredible that she finished that fight at the end. That says everything, though, when you've got a fighter that is going for the finish, even at the very end. That's what you're looking for. Nice knee inside by Tim Johnson. Keep in mind what John talked about earlier is the arm position where Tim Johnson wants to be over the arms of Moldovsky. Normally we're searching for underhooks. That's what Moldovsky is actually getting, but if you're going to get that overhook position like Tim is, you can put a lot of weight. Make those arms of Moldovsky get very heavy. Big weekend on Showtime tomorrow. Knockout specialist, Javante Tank Davis looks to become a three-division world champion. It's his second Showtime pay-per-view facing the undefeated super lightweight world champion, El Azteca, Mario Barrios. Tomorrow at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific Live on Showtime pay-per-view. Well, let's look at the end of that round two. Nice sequence here at the end. You see Johnson lands the left hand. Moldovsky throws. <laughs> John's saying, what's up? I'm standing here. I'm still here. Take a look at the shots here. That was a nice left hand. Didn't hit, you know, flush, but it landed on target. Moldovsky lands a left. Good job, boy. Johnson goes after him. Good job. That was a tail of two, you know, the first part of there that round. Go. I thought Moldovsky yep. was doing very Ready? well. Johnson kind of finished Let's it up well. Enough to win it. I actually, I gave it to Tim Johnson. I thought in the end he was landing some clean shots. The one difference there was that knee. I really, you know, yep. That really has me concerned because that was in the very beginning of the round. But I gave it to Tim Johnson. Right now I have it even. Two close rounds either way. Good combination from Moldovsky. Constantly moving. Remember, he's never been in a round four. Whoa. Well, neither is Tim Johns. Tim has been in four five-round fights, but not one of them went past the second round. So he was, a, he was the winner in all those, but now he's up against someone that can definitely take him into those rounds and we'll see how both guys fare in their championship round. And it's really been a story of both of these guys are good wrestlers and their wrestlings have canceled each other out. That's why we're getting this stand-up battle. Surprised by that? No, not at all. It is common, you know, effect. You know, a guy has to make the mistake or get hit by the shot that puts him down because you can burn so much energy in trying to get your opponent down when they are a good wrestler also. Also, that it's almost not worth it. Moldovsky making a big mistake by going straight yes. back. Yes, he has given Tim Johnson very few opportunities to get him against the fence, and he gave him one there. 
Two minutes prošlo Talked about the head movement. Do you notice a difference in the striking of Tim Johnson from the first couple of Bellator fights over this last year? Oh, absolutely. He's so much more relaxed. And because he, when you're not comfortable in something, you start to press and you start to get tense. And you can see the difference. And although, you know, he would rather be wrestling. Let's just be honest about it. But he's not he's not under duress while he's out there standing up. You know, he can throw good shots. And he's taking better shots because they're not landing flush. They're grazing, they're sliding off. It's not those ones that are going to put them out of being dead center right on Short right, connected from Aldowski. Hard to get a guy moving backwards like that. He's so quick he to get out of danger. It's the first real takedown attempt, level change. Tim needs to fight this, get himself back to his feet. He does not want Moldovsky being on top of him, getting the hooks in. <laughs> You don't want to be taking those shots because you're going to be feeling those in round four and five. Great strike. That right there, that's what is your Moldovsky. That's a great movie because Tim works hard to get himself back to his feet and then you taking Rihanna right back to the canvas. Using his weight against him. Exactly. Now, and you're making him carry your weight. I think you know, we talk because of the weight disparity. We talk about like as if 234 was nothing, right? Hey, it's so light. Oh, he's only 234. That was obviously on the scales. Bigger tonight. I think the uh, the unheralded part about that is not having to cut that people don't talk about. It is a huge part of it because you know, you're comfortable, you're not you're not depleting your body, you're doing actually what an athlete's supposed to do. <laughs> so the championship rounds we go in the championship fight. I see perhaps no stool. A lot of the scars of the wars on that face of Tim Johnson. Championship round, Tim. Here we go. The last six years of the highest level of this sport. Three straight wins here in Bellator, giving him this opportunity. An amazing year. He's dipping on your combo. Johnson throwing that. Jab out, going with that left hand, trying to bring his head into it. But Second just trying down. to force Moldovsky up against the cage, but Moldovsky turns him. Nice right hand by Moldovsky. This is a little bit better than Johnson's in that sequence, but look, it's been a close fight. That was Moldovsky's round. Yep. You ready? But you ready? Again, we got two fight. more rounds to go here. Anything can happen. Think about the year Tim Johnson has had. We talked about the wins, the three fight win streak. Becoming a dad. Back to serve in the National Guard in his home in Minnesota. And he served during the Derek Chauvin trial. While the rest of us have spent the last year job watching the world on TV, he lived it. Yeah, he was living it. And, you know, and also think about it, you know, that took away from training. Yeah. You know, in the National Guard, you just don't get to go train when you want and do all the things. You have certain assignments. And so hats off to Tim Johnson and what he gives to the country. <laughs> Both guys slinging a little bit of leather there. 
just the speed of the exchange is different. You can just, what Josh said earlier, right? Speed kills. That's why we say it. You know, we're talking about this extraordinary documentary on Showtime. Think about Sugar Ray Leonard and Marvin Hagler. So wherever you feel about that fight, sure, you couldn't get him. He was coming pop, 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 and then back out. And this is a heavyweight in Moldovsky, and he is just, he's gone before you're even, he's exactly. even funny. You go, you go back to that Marvin Hagler and Sugar Ray, it was speed in the last 30 seconds that Sugar Ray Leonard would just start to blaze that speed and throw a ton of shots. It swayed the judges and who won that fight. And one of our own earlier tonight with Daniel Weichel getting a controversial split decision win over Keone Diggs. Liz Carbush for the first round knockout. That's going to be a big part of the story tomorrow. An opening minute knockout. Connor Watanabe. Go. <laughs> present right now. Shot stunned Moldovsky for a second. Nemkov. And we have a, we don't even talk about Tokov at 185 because he's had issues traveling wise over the last year or two. Yeah. But there is a scenario by which by the middle of late next year, I mean they could have you know the goat there could have all the gold. <laughs> all in the upper weight division. Yeah. No doubt about it. Which, of course, begs the question, naturally, everyone assumes the winner of this fight will fight Ryan Bader and the title will be unified. But we don't know what's going to happen in the light heavyweight Grand Prix. You don't know when it's going to end, how far Ryan Bader is going to go. It, it could be a long time before he is ready to fight heavyweight. Look at little Georgia Johnson. And he's fighting for the heavyweight championship. That is a life changer right there. Fight. Nice shot by Moldovsky there. Oh, the clean. Oh, oh, side. Tips cut. You see the damage now. We talked earlier in the, before the second round, Todd Anderson warned about, watch your heads, the clash of heads. We think that's how that cut opened up. Yeah, I think it was when they came together at that one point and such. Tim's head over to the side. The top of the head of Moldovsky lands on that. <laughs> Where does Tim Johnson want his hands to be? Well, right now he's fine with where his hands are because he's keeping himself from being taken down. He's, he's got to be smart. He's got the underhook with his left hand, trying to throw shots with his right. But this is a 50-50 position right now. He's got what you see as he starts to splay his legs back just a little bit, trying to put a little bit more weight down. That's just his way of trying to get Oscar to have to carry that weight. Remember, Tim Johnson just said a right-handed person could fight southpaw, which means that cut is out front. Look at the die job it has done on Moldovsky's hair. Tim Johnson coming forward. Not quite enough, though. He's thrown shots, but they have not gone through. And we're going to round five. Hey, that's what Tim Johnson said. That was a head. That was a clash of heads. He points where's, to the cut. Where's Mike? I need to. Nasty nice deep spot. breaths, Tim. Nice deep breaths. Yeah, let's Here's how that happened. Take a look at the head of Moldovsky, comes right oh. into that brow area of Tim Johnson. Tim, that up cross connected in that last oh, round. There was no intent on either fighter's part to have that happen. It's just what we call an accidental clash of the heads. Unfortunately, Tim Johnson gets cut by it.
Two men from divergent backgrounds at different stages of their career. And together they have taken each other where they have never gone before to round five of the championship fight. Very nice job by Cup Man Dean Lasser to close that up. Did a good job. Not easy to do. Everyone thinks, oh, I could do that. Not an easy job. Good Cup Man. Everybody's Pat Melitz, right? Put those down. <laughs> That's great at doing this. 3 1, Moldovsky. Right now, I have Moldovsky at 3 1. So, all Tim Johnson has to do to become a heavyweight champion is finish a guy who's never been finished. Never really been close to being finished. He can do it. That, you see that big right hand coming out? It has to do. Look, that, that's the same right hand that put Tyrell Fortune, a guy that had not lost any fights up to that point, put him unconscious. So Tim has the power to still put Maldowski out. Tyrell Fortune will try to get back on the winning track. It's Matt Mitrione. Look at the total strikes landed, 23 of 100 for Tim Johnson, 61 to 159 for Moldowski. Johnson didn't uh, landed more as the fight has gone on, but they have been few and far between. Moldowski is so hard to hit, he's just in and out. <laughs> There's only so much you can do when it cut that deep. Well, as soon as it gets touched again, it's going to start to bleed. It. Change. Tim Johnson was way ahead of him there. Valentin right. Moldovsky started at the highest level almost immediately. His second full fight. You ref the jump. I called it. It was in Tokyo. He was fighting on that big stage at the debut of Rising. He had that it factor from the beginning. You could tell he was going to be something special. Yeah, he's just a solid fighter all around. His ability to control when they clinch, when he comes in. But, you know, Tim Johnson has got him concerned many times in this fight. You can see Moldovsky starts to get a little bit hesitant on when he's going to start standing there and throwing shots with Tim Johnson throwing back. Is there any way you get this performance from Tim Johnson a year and a half? No, not at all. No, it was the start when you know, he fought Tyrell Fortune. That was the change because that was when the training that he was you know, doing in Las Vegas with the guys he was with was starting to take you know, effect. He was starting to get an idea of, hey, I just need to do these little things and it's going to change how many times I get hit in the fight. It's made a different fighter out of it. Tim Johnson at this point is a really good heavyweight fighter that can be in there with anybody. He, he earned this spot and he has delivered tonight against a, a younger fighter, stronger fighter in so many ways, quicker. I love the thing. You know, what I'm seeing out of Tim Johnson right now says everything you need to know from what's going on here. He waited his entire life to get a fight like this, to have an opportunity for a championship. And all the work is paid off. He has brought it for all 25 minutes. He's still winging that right hand, trying to make it land. I don't blame him. That's the, that's the one that's going to put Maldowski down. Think about Fedor. Think about the face of this sport for so many years. And has any athlete that dominant over 
just seeing the next generation the way he has had success like this. He stands with a world champion over his right shoulder, and he may very well in 25 seconds be staring at him. Absolutely might be. There's been a few guys, and you brought up one, Pat Militech. He had a lot of champions, too. But this group fighting for Team Fedor is pretty special. Tim Johnson going all 25, putting on a show. A championship fight that delivered. And Tim Johnson is the perfect example, win or lose, in this championship fight tonight of almost a reinvention at age 35, 36 at the highest level. Right here is the end of the fight. These guys going after you see Tim Johnson bringing the flex in. Here I am. Let's go. Let's throw. Moldowski swinging leather. Tim Johnson swinging leather. Also just yelling at him. That, that's just horrible. You should not be able to yell at your opponent like that. I love it. Good job by Tim Johnson. They both guys gave it everything they had. That was a good, well-matched fight. Both guys had their moments, but I think Moldovsky is going to get the knock. Uh, I think you and I see it that way. Stepping back, do you see any scenario this goes the other way? Is it close enough that it could go the other way? Yeah, you know, if, if you go back and you look, the first <laughs> round was close. There was, you know, moments you could say, well, you, you could give it to Johnson. And if you do, that kind of swings this whole thing around because I had Johnson winning, you know, several rounds, and I had Moldovsky winning, you know, three, so. We'll see what happens. Numbers are going to be lopsided as far as the strikes landed, certainly. Yeah, Moldovsky no doubt landed more shots in this fight. Now, there was several times, you know, that fifth round, Tim Johnson landed that beautiful knee inside to the body. Those are the, those are sometimes the telling blows. There was the ones earlier that Moldovsky landed. Bader's throne is about to get a little more crowded. Michael C. Williams is going to tell us who will join him. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance in this world title fight, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Doug Crosby, scores the fight 50-45. Eric Colon, 49-46, and Brian Miner, 49-46. All three have it for the winner by unanimous decision. And now the interim Bellator heavyweight world champion, Valentin Malovsky. There was even doubt in the mind of Valentin Moldovsky. You could see the sigh of relief for a second. But as Josh Thompson was saying earlier, there is no feeling like this one as his dream has come true. The new interim heavyweight champion is with John McCarthy. Valentin Moldovsky, I know you are tired. I know you don't want to talk to me, but that was a very tough fight with a very tough competitor in Tim Johnson. Talk to me about what that fight was like for you. Как ты, как ты себя чувствуешь и как ты себя ощущаешь? Устал, но рад, что победил. Конечно, недоволен боем, я думал, я полег, полегче пройду. Ну, получилось, как получилось, слава богу, победил. I'm very tired, I'm very happy I won. I thought it was going to be a little easier fight, but it is what it is. Many times... Tim was trying to suck you into a brawl, getting you fired up to just stand there and swing with him. What were you thinking, and what was your idea in entering that brawl or staying away from it? Tim, тебя брал в клич и хотел с тобой либо махаться, либо в кличе. Что ты хотел делать, бою? Не знаю. Смотрел по ситуации, ну понимал, что за счет контроля в клетке или перевода могу забрать крайние раунды. Поэтому так и поработал, проконтролировал клетки. 
Yeah, I was kind of assessing the situation. I was looking for transitions from uh, the stand-up ground or either in the clinch. So I was just assessing by the situation and going with the plan. Right now, Ryan Bader is the heavyweight champion. You just took the interim championship. Do you have a message for Ryan Bader? No, нет. Нет, дальше, когда начну к нему готовиться, тогда уже будут предположения. Сейчас, пока я выиграл, в ближайшее время я о нем думать не буду. No, not for now, but once I start preparing, I'll definitely send them something out, but for now, I'm, I'm not going to say anything. Well, I want to tell you, congratulations on becoming the first interim heavyweight champion here in Bellator. Congratulations on a great fight. Ladies and gentlemen, your new champion, Valentin Moldovsky. Now, what you wanted to see tonight was a championship fight and a championship performance, and Tim Johnson made Valentin hey, Moldovsky yes, earn that gold around his waist, taking him the full 25 minutes. And now his arm around a man. I mean, think about, it's hard not to think dynasty when you think about what could be ahead for the next year, what exists right now for Team Fedor. Guys, that was what a lot of people didn't think we were going to see tonight, which was an exciting championship fight worthy of that title. Well, it certainly was a Team Vader going home with another Bellator belt tonight. Josh, you called it. You said speed was going to be the factor tonight. It certainly was. Take a look at that picture. It's amazing. The person next to Moldovsky is our light heavyweight champion. He towers over Moldovsky. Look at that. The size. Moldovsky is very impressive, and the speed was the biggest factor tonight. And it showed. Every time Tim Johnson tried to press him in the fence, he circled out, made sure Tim couldn't press him in the fence, put his weight on. Him. He did a great job of putting together his combinations. That was that was amazing. Great job, great performance by Moldovsky. Well, he's going to face Ryan Bader uh, he, as his next opponent. Ryan Bader uh, was watching tonight. You hear, you can see. He said a great fight. Moldovsky looked good. He was fast. Cardio was on point. He says I'm looking forward to coming back a heavyweight. Let's get it. So that's that's his message. Of, of course, Moldovsky said he was going to wait to put his message out. Uh, how do you think? these two match up what do you what do you like about this fight so I love that fight but let's just be let's I want to be honest with the fans at home that are watching there might be a chance where Ryan Bader moves on to the finals ends up fighting in the finals that could take some time Moldovsky may have to defend his interim title so I don't want to stamp it too much too soon right now but stylistically like that yeah. matchup though is amazing both of them smaller heavyweights both of them fast on the feet both of them have really good stand of them both of them are great wrestlers it's going to be a great fight it certainly is hey we had a great night of fights tonight it's great fights on our prelims it's always fun having you here at the desk with us uh you know we're going to do it again three weeks from now all i got to say is liz carmouche delivered tonight congratulations to liz absolutely well uh, bellator nation if you'd like to revisit any portion of tonight's fight action showtime's got you covered you can check your listings to find replays of Bellator MMA on Showtime and Showtime Extreme. Well, Friday, July 16th, the featherweight title is on the line. This is the one Liz Carmouche is going to be watching. Miss Dynamite in number four ring, Denise Keelholtz gets her shot at gold versus the champion and undefeated Juliana Velasquez. The flyweights get it done. That's Friday, July 16th, only on Showtime. Well, fight fans, don't go anywhere because coming up next, a sneak peek at tomorrow night's Showtime pay-per-view event. It is an encore presentation of All Access, Davis versus Barrios, episode two. So be sure to stick around for that. All right. Well, that does it up here for us at the Fight Desk. Sean, another fantastic night of Bellator MMA action for our fight fans tonight. Back over to you. It absolutely was, Jen. Who knows? We could be headed for Ryan Bader. Heading into the gauntlet of Team Fedor. That's the way 2022 is starting to shape up. Jen talked about the night. It began with one of the big time prospects of 205, Christian Edwards, and he was dominant in every single round against the game, Simon Beyond. But yeah, it was thumbs up pretty much all the way for Christian Edwards. He goes to 5 0. We thought Daniel Vitro, Keone Diggs could be the fight of the night. It might have been, but the decision left a sour taste in some people's mouth. Daniel Vitro getting the split decision win. In a fascinating fight at 155, Sydney Outlaw 
dominated on the ground and kept Miles Jury there for 15 minutes. Miles Jury trying to throw some Hail Marys late and got subbed in the final few seconds. Biggest win of the MMA career for Sydney Outlaw. But this is what people are going to be talking about. Liz Carmouche answering her critics with a 35 second knockout win, all leading to Valentin Moldowski beating Tim Johnson for the interim heavyweight championship. For Michael C. Williams, Josh Thompson, Jen Brown, and John McCarthy, I'm Sean Grady. Great to be back with you. We'll see you in three weeks back here on Showtime.